원래 부처님의 가르침으로 When let's I mean, let's start here. Sure. Um, I would sometimes speak to uh, students or people like, "What are you doing this weekend?" I would ask them, "What are you doing this weekend? What's going on?" They'd look at me and they'd go sleeping, mm. and I thought that was just. An excuse or something to say that they didn't want to tell me what they were doing, or it was just brushing me off. And it was only after I spent some time here and started dating some girls and things like that that I realized, hang on, they are actually sleeping the weekend. Mm -hmm. It was that was what they were doing. Um, and we've all seen the pictures of sort of Korean kids hunched over desks in lecture halls and that you know getting the power nap in between the breaks in the in the class and things like this. It, Do we know how much Koreans sleep? Yeah, we actually do, and it's actually not very much. Um, I can give you some statistics. Let's see. So, you know, out of all the OECD countries, mm. uh, Koreans rank uh, last for sleeping, uh, sleeping the least. They sleep about like seven hours and 51 minutes. And that number is actually, if you think about it, it's not that bad. It's pretty good. Yeah, but the reason is because they don't sleep, sleep a lot during the week. Yeah. And then they're actually like making up for it in the weekend, like sleeping like 18 hours on the weekend. And mm. another study found, uh, it was a little bit uh, less than that, uh, found that Korea slept about six hours and 25 minutes. And the only uh, country that was worse was Japan at six hours and 18 minutes. So you can see, you know, Korea does not sleep a lot. Is that a bad thing? Well, you know, the National uh, Sleep Foundation and the American Association of Sleep Medicine do recommend at least seven to eight hours of sleep for adults. It is yeah. different for everyone. Right. I mean, not everyone needs that much sleep. Or, you know, some people just need more, and it is a little bit of a bell curve. Mm. But it's, it's important to get the sleep that you need so you can function during the day. If you're falling asleep during meetings or during lecture or even, like, while riding the bus, mm. you know, it's probably a good indication that you're not getting enough sleep. Sleep, and you're not, you know, up to your most optimal level. Koreans always seem to be at the bottom or top of lists. They're never in the middle. So yeah, this Korean of all, we don't like to be in the middle. No, we no. like to be the best or the worst. Yeah, yeah. And so I've often made that joke that if Korea ever legalized marijuana, they would be the top. We must be number one of the smokers <laughs> <laughs> around the world. So does this match up to your own? So the statistics say that Korea is they sleep the least out of the OECD. Is that right? What's your personal take on that? Does that seem yeah. to match up to reality? I think it's uh, pretty common. You know, if you think about like the Huesawan, you know, the people who go to work every day, a lot of it is characterized by the work that they do after hours. You know, mm. there's this thing called Yagen, which I don't think I saw a lot when I lived in the States. You know, like usually in, in the States, it's all about work life balance. People are going home to see their mm. family whereas here it's pretty common to work really late and if they're the parents are coming home late the children probably will stay up because they want to see their parents and things like that and there's also the after hour entertainment mm. you know you know the heshik mm -hmm. types of things which will cause them to curtail their sleep time as well and you know when you go home it's not easy to just you know plop onto bed and go to sleep right away usually you want to you know like get a, have a little bit of time to decompress you know take a shower do some stuff that you need to do mm. and when all that happens it's usually pretty late. So I think it's pretty common uh, for a lot of people who work. And even for students, you know, I think the more most alarming statistic is actually for adolescents, which is when they're growing and they mm. need the most sleep. And, uh, you know, just some statistics in 2014, the Korean CDC found that about one third of kids do um, experience some type of sleep deprivation, so they're not getting enough sleep. And uh, they sleep uh, about less than six hours uh, 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 per day, which is actually not that high of a bar, you know, mm. approximately 44% of adolescents sleep less than six hours a day, which is actually quite a really high number. And just to give you a little bit of a, a comparison, you know, if you look at the American CDC data, 17% of mm. teenagers sleep less than six hours. So it's about more than five or six times uh, the rate of what you would see in, in different countries. Mm. And, you know, I think it's characterized by the lifestyle. You know, you have to get into this good college, and then you, for in order to do that, you have to go to the hagwans, mm. which, you know, are usually open until like 11, 12 at night, trying to prepare you for all the exams. And then, you know, it would be great if that would be the end, but usually, you know, they go on to study even more, yeah. and then they don't come home and until really 
like in early in the morning and then they have to you know get a couple hours of of wink of sleep before they have to go to school so it's really not enough i think mm. before we come to the to the teenagers and maybe sure. how that might affect you know mental health and things like that and growing in that developmental stage you said that it was career in japan Mm -hmm. uh, that, that sleep least in these two studies, sure. like cultural sensitivity time. I mean, is, is is that geographic? Is that cultural? I mean, these are two countries next to each other sure. with some similar traits between them, let's sure. say. Um, is there a reason why this is happening? Why Korea and Japan are sleeping? That, that's least? a really good question. I actually don't know that much about Japanese culture to comment on that. But, you know, uh, I do know that they have kind of a similar like after hour work, mm -hmm. uh, entertainment, things like that. A lot of the business does happen after hours. Mm. And I think this this really high competition, competitive culture, I think, does also kind of tie into that as well. So th I think it's a host of different things, you know, always feeling that you have to be on the go, you know, produce something, be a productive person. And rest is not very valued in these in these cultures. I think that's that says a lot. Yeah. And I wonder if people did rest with because I would imagine that in the Joseon dynasty people were sleeping more. Especially the Yang Ban or, or, or the aristocrats, if, if you could do some studies. But I think they would have been more in tune with their what's the word? Like bio circadian rhythms or circadian rhythms. circadians mm -hmm. thank you yeah they would have been more in tune with their bio circadian rhythms and they would have gone with it and things like this but now to get korea to where it is today from from the mud from the poverty from the devastation to this techno wonder beast that we see mm -hmm. around us <laughs> this room's not the best example of it but you know what i mean um that if people did sleep that maybe it wouldn't have happened maybe that that like it, it was essential I'm, I'm just wondering whether it was Korea and Japan both had to develop very quickly. Sure. And I'm sure that had a very huge contributing factor to that. You know, you know, this notion of you have to be productive and, and make something of yourself or mm. even for men, like take care of your family. It's a collectivistic culture. So you're not just responsible for yourself. You're also responsible for like, you know, 10 other people in your family. And, yeah. and that in and of itself has to, you know, it takes up a lot of time. Uh, but, you know, it's it, it's very tiresome. And I think one of the things that is that you're not allowed to rest. It's rest is li is looked up upon as lazy. Mm. You know, it's not you're not yeah. allowed to sleep. One of the things that I hear a lot with my students is, that, you know, they, they like to take semesters off, you know, and I ask them when they come back, oh, you know, like, how was your semester? And I would imagine them probably like traveling or doing something fun. And they're like, oh, I felt so guilty because I wasn't taking classes or I wasn't doing this. And I got like three chagokjins. And, mm. You know, like they, they were really productive even in the time that they had deliberately planned to rest. So I, I think that's interesting. You know, it has to say something about the culture. Yeah. The culture that demands hard work and productivity. And and the word sometimes people use these days is katseng, mm. this God life that mm. you have to really be pushing it. It's not enough to get three certificates. Sure, you need five, sure. six, seven. Sure. And, and, you know, it's it's co competition. You know, everyone compares themselves to other people. So if the your cousin is getting six, you know, you might as well get seven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And if you sleep five hours a night, you'll get to this university. If you sleep four hours a night, exactly. you'll get to this university. Yeah, that's I, a very big, there's a very famous saying that we sleep researchers really hate. Yeah. <laughs> What, it, what it's along those lines that if you yeah sleep, yeah okay. you're, I mean you're not you're not allowed to sleep if you want to show have good results you know like sleep is is overrated as, mm. as they would say which is not as a sleep researcher but you know if you're sleeping that probably means that you're not you know you're not going to be getting the results that you wanted yeah how widely known is this because if you pick up a a korean newspaper an international newspaper you'll see a lot of stuff about k-pop you'll see a lot of stuff about mental health and all of these things these are well publicized both the the cultural successes and the modern pulan and anxieties and things like this when you say that korea sleeps the least of the oecds and uh, is this well known amongst society is it something that yeah. people get I think it's become more prevalent and more widespread, like people are becoming more aware of it in the past 10 years, I would say. Mm. You know, when I first came to Korea in 2011, when I finished my PhD, I think, you know, people were like, sleep isn't important, you know, like, <laughs> what? why are you studying it, you know? And then now I think, you know, there's all these statistics that come out, we're finding 
um, that kids aren't sleeping very much. And, and I think the statistic that is really tied to that is, is the suicide rate. Mm. So sleep mm. is one of the top 10 risk factors for suicide. Wow. And a lot of people, you know, if you don't sleep a lot, mm. you, there's a lot of, it's kind of goes hand in hand. So if you don't sleep a lot, it puts you at risk for a lot of mental health issues that mm-hmm. will cause, that may cause suicide. But also, you know, uh, just not sleeping in general, I think is just means that you might be at high risk, you know. So I think that's also, it just means that your your body is in threat mode and you need help. Mm. And, and that's a good time to get help. And I think that those kind of two statistics do go hand in hand. Mm. What prompted people to look at these this sleep then? You said that when you first come, people are like, why are you looking at sleep? That's not important. But now there's more of a focus on it, perhaps. Do you know what's uh, prompted that shift, that change in focus? Or Well, I think there has been a little bit more of a shift towards, you know, like you've heard about like work-life balance. I think that became mm. a kind of a keyword for yeah. a while. There's the leisure industry is really booming. What do they call it here? It's like Walla Bell. Walla Bell, Wola yeah, Bell. Yeah, sorry. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. At first I was like, what? But <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a Disney princess. Exactly. I, that's, I yeah, thought yeah, like, yeah. I said another princess. <laughs> but, um, you know, like I think there is a little bit more focus on this leisure yeah. life that yeah. and people, you know, now that they have the ec- economic stability, mm. I think they're more interested in, in having that. And uh, and the thing is that it's not really possible to have that unless you you kind of you know you don't you don't if you if you lose sleep if you kind of cut down your sleep you mm. can have a little bit more leisure in your life mm-hmm. and so I think there was that interest in that sense yeah so you know like how I think sleep being a little bit part more uh, associated with your mental well being and things like that are all part of kind of that interest in leisure as well. So with the so they're moving up the Maslow's hierarchy of needs or something. Uh, They've got the material stuff satiated, and now they're like, now I want some. Perhaps, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think that too, and also this kind of focus on health as well. Yeah. I think uh, yeah. there are a lot of people now that people are living longer. It's not like they're you know back in the day people used to celebrate that the fact that you've turned sixty. I yeah. mean, no one really does that anymore, right? So, <laughs> right. No, you, you look around for some congratulations and people will complain that you get free subway. Yeah. You don't get free subway rides no, at 60. No, no, not at all. And so, you know, I think with people living longer, yeah. you know, people are dying more from chronic illness, not from acute illness. Mm-hmm. And so that means that, you know, 15 to 20 years before you die, you know what you're going to die of. And and with that, you know, it's, it's part of your health. So you have to manage your health so that you could live longer, live your quality of life will be better. And I think a key part of that is, is going to be sleep. Mm. So by studying sleep and by Koreans focusing more on sleep, it's saving lives. Like, can we just maybe dig into a little bit that mental health thing a bit? Because you said, especially for adolescents, so maybe if we go there, um, it breaks my heart, the statistic that suicide is the leading cause of death for young Korean youths, Mm -hmm. right? So there's a lot of elderly people that commit suicide. And I would also say that suicide is sometimes seen as a a protest tool or it's a little bit different here. They didn't grow up with the ideas of sin and purgatory and limbo and all that. Um, But the number one cause of death for Korean young people is suicide. So it's not drugs, it's not violence, it's it's not guns or misadventure and Mm. bungee jumping, but it's people taking their own lives. And we also know that these kids have to study ridiculous amounts Mm -hmm. when they do their sinning, when they do their Korean SATs. So is a a, a lot of their mental health ailments or some of them is caused by the lack of sleep? Uh, I mean, it's a little bit of a bi-directional relationship if you think about it. If Mm -hmm. you don't sleep enough, it does put you at risk for a host of different mental disorders. Mm. For example, depression, anxiety disorder. You know, you might want to drink more, have another drink just to get yourself to try to sleep. Mm. You know, a lot of different types of mental disorders. But also, if you have these mental disorders, many of the symptoms are actually not sleeping very well or sleeping too much. Mm. So it's kind of uh, it's kind of a bi-directional relationship. So the disease can cause the sleep problems Mm. or the sleep problems can cause the disease. Mm. And do you think that's playing out that way in South Korea? I mean, is is it something that's actually happening, do you think? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, the mental health rate, uh, the mental illness rates have mm. been soaring. Uh, and, you know, I think a part of it is is kind of showing like with the low birth rates, high suicidality rates. Mm. I think it shows that there is something kind of going on that is making people really sad and feeling hopeless. Mm. I mean, a big piece of that suicide is that nothing that I can do is really going to make a difference. And mm. thus, you know, the only way that I feel I can solve all my problems is, is to die. You know, I think that's the mindset for a lot of people. Mm. And, you know, I think just maybe the way that this even suicide is portrayed in the media, I think may have a little bit of a problem, uh, may be part of the problem, I think. Yeah. I've definitely seen portrayals in the media and sometimes it's glamorized. And I often notice that the good guys would commit suicide sure. or they would take the noble way out. And I'd be watching these movies and dramas going, hang on, no, the good guy is meant to kill the bad guy, get the girl and sail off into the right, sunset. But right. in Korean movies, I noticed that the good guy would take their own life at the right, end or something. Right. It was the honorable way out. How, how is sleep? These are weird questions sort of, but have you seen the way like sleep is portrayed in the media or in movies or things like that? Because I don't know if, if you research and study sleep, then you must be kind of conscious every time it comes up and you're like, sure. they're not really sleeping. That's not how people sleep. Well, I think, uh, I think there is that that portrayal of like working really hard. There's the protagonist that, you know, like sacrifices sleep and mm. and works really hard to get their goals. And I think that kind of reinforces the fact that, you know, you have to sacrifice sleep in order to to get to where you want. Mm. So I think there is that. Um, also, you know, I think there is that thing of uh, people drinking to try to fall asleep, which is actually a terrible thing to do for your sleep. Oh, I, I, I wake up if I drink. Right. And, and most Seriously. people do. It's, a, it, it's it, mm. it helps you maybe fall asleep a little bit faster. Mm. It sedates you because yeah. it's, it's alcohol is in a class of, the, of sedatives, sedatives. Mm. But, you know, it doesn't make you necessarily sleep better or longer or mm. even get into the more deeper restorative stages of sleep. I heard that uh, there are in very broad strokes there are two types of people that it'll get to about 11 o'clock after a few drinks and some people are getting tired mm -hmm. after a few drinks and for some people it's just beginning and there's there's no end in sight I'm, I'm part of the second group and and these people have very high tendencies towards alcoholism and things like that where it's uh, uh there's never enough or something like that so I, it doesn't make me sleep at all. Rather the opposite. Mm. Korea is a very bad country for that because right, yeah. I come from a place where they would ring the bell at 1030 and you have to go home. Uh, no, not here. <laughs> not in Korea. Yeah. But that's part of the, it's not just pubs and, uh, and bars and clubs, but it's also shops and things like that. This is right. a pretty 24 hour right, place, isn't right. it? Right. And, and you can see by the uh, by the proportion of people who are shift workers, about 30% of the population are shift workers. Oh, I mean, wow. you can think hey, it's a pretty high number. Yeah. And these people have, have terrible work schedules. You know, yeah. they have to work around the clock. So you have these in, in places like America, you have shift workers mm. who only work the night shift, which is which is OK if you're a night person. You know, you mm. you sleep during the day, you work at night and you have very set hours where in. In places like Korea, uh, the more popular type of work schedule mm. is something called a rotating shift schedule mm. where you're like, you know, one day you're a day, day shift, the next day you're a night shift, and then you just go round the clock. And so every day your sleep is changing, which is not a really good thing for your circadian rhythm or your body rhythm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and the reason is that, you know, do you, do you like getting uh, stuff delivered to you in, early in the morning? Like... Coupon or mar market curly. My wife does. I'll yeah. testify to that. I've, sure. I've never I mean, ordered that doesn't show yeah. up magically. Someone yeah. is yes. working yes. really yeah. late at night to get that stuff to yeah. you, you know? Yeah, yeah. It used to it used to be bottles of milk outside the door when you opened up. But now <laughs> now it's anything that you can dream of will come to your door. I didn't know it was 30%. That's yeah, it's about it's about I mean, that's including like engineers. Yeah. Yes. Like, you know, like lots of people who have to, you know, be on call for a system that needs to be on 24 hours, like firefighters, mm. policemen. Mm. It is a pretty high, uh, high rate. Yeah. And if they're doing that alternating shift work, like you say, that it makes it even harder to get into any uh, kind of rhythm. One of the things I just mentioned, my wife and her uh, proclivities for ordering things, which I fully support and I like, and we need the things that she orders. One of the things that we might argue about sometimes is what time our children go to bed here in Korea. Mm. Um, Edward and Elizabeth, our two children, um, eight and six, although eight and nearly seven. I vividly remember when I must have been about seven, eight, something like that, that 
my parents would make me go to bed at 7.30. Mm. Like the theme tune for the, the, the soap opera EastEnders, it was a mm. British one. It would come on and they would sing for me to go to bed. And I had to go upstairs to my room at like 7.30. Right. And it was because I think they wanted to, you know, sit and have a glass of wine and watch television and the, mm. the kids go upstairs. And um, that was just the way it was. And so I'm used to this idea that kids, you know, they should be in bed by nine o'clock at least or something. Sure. That's Especially when they're that young. Um, but here they're running around much later than nine o'clock. Yeah. You know, they're 10, 11 and they're still boom, 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 right. boom. Or even I'll, I'll say to my son, like, it's time to go to bed, Edward. And he'll say, I haven't done my Gumon homework yet. And he's got his little... Goom on right. like home study pages he's doing. Um, what do you notice about sort of not the amount people are sleeping, but the time people are sleeping, especially for Koreans and kids? Well, for kids, I think that is definitely the case. You know, you know, I I, I was in America this past year, and I noticed you know most kids go to bed by seven thirty eight. You know, it is very common, and you know my my kid is eight now, and yeah. you know all his friends were going to bed around like 7 38 and it was you know a pretty common thing and you ask kids here they're going to bed at like 12 or yeah. 1 yeah. o'clock and you know i think there's a, a lot of reasons one is you know what i mentioned earlier they have a lot of stuff to do they have like studying they have to go to the hagwans mm. and they have to come home do all the homeworks and that keeps them up but the second thing is also you know that the parents are coming home late they have these after hour work things and you know the kids want to see their parents after a long day it's very natural mm. for kids you know they want to yeah. at least say have someone tuck them in in. You know, the parents actually don't want their kids to go to bed before they see them because that's their only chance of, of seeing them through the day. Mm. And when they do come home, you know, they don't, the kids don't go to sleep right away. It's not like, okay, I saw you. Bye. Good Ooh. night. Yeah, it's, yeah. You know, usually there's a little bit of, you know, bonding time going on. The, mm. the parent might feel guilty and try to play with the kid a little bit, which might excite them a little bit more. I mean, there's, mm. a, there's a, really a host of things, I think, that go on. But it's true that kids go to bed much later. Is it a case of, well, in, in, in America or the United Kingdom, they do it that way? And in Korea, here we do it this way. Is it just a case of cultural differences? Or is there, as a, as a sleep expert, Ali, do you look at that and go... You know, that's, that's a bit late. Or is it just a cultural difference? Or? Uh, so as a sleep researcher, I yeah. definitely think it, it, is not, it shouldn't be a cultural difference. And I do think the kids should go to bed earlier, especially if it's if the things that are keeping them up are more, you know, like work stuff. You know, mm. like I do think that, you know, your, your second grader doesn't need to be up until 12, you know, solving <laughs> math problems. <laughs> right. But, you know, I think there is also a cultural aspect there. Um, I think, you know, because the, there is such little bonding time between the parent and the child, I think if that's the only time, you know, maybe that is something that, you know, has value and, and that is something to, to think about. Mm. But I don't know if I don't know if we can from a, from a scientific standpoint, maybe not the great best thing from a cultural standpoint, probably need to consider it a little, consider it a little bit more. Mm. But it's a reality here that children exactly. do go to bed mm -hmm. so much later than other. Well, certainly where I'm from and perhaps where you're from. What time do your kids go to bed? Uh, my kids go to bed. Well, they, when they were in California, <laughs> they were getting a lot of sun. So they were going to bed around 8. Okay. Like we would get them in bed by 7.30. They were out by 8. Here, um, it's been a little bit later. So it's been about between 9 to 9.30. So that's about an hour later. And, and even that makes me feel really uncomfortable. Yeah. I want to say I want them in bed by 8 usually. That's pretty early for Korea. Do you feel that that's pretty early for Korean time, though? I think like that's 9, pretty early. Yeah. 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 If, if they don't go to bed by 10, I get, I get so angry. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I do think it's a little bit early, but I also notice that, you know, my, my kids are usually pretty happy during the day. Yeah. They, they're they able to focus. They don't they never say they're like super tired or anything. Mm. And I think I think that's important. You know, you know, I don't want them to be so sleepy during the day that they can't focus at school. Mm. You know, you, ha you have to understand that sleep is, is not a, a night problem. It's a 24 hour problem. Mm. If you have a sleep problem, it's going to affect the way that you perform during the day and and the way that you feel during the day as well. Yeah. And so I you know I would want my kids to make the most out of their day, not not just you know, uh, be tired all the time. Do they wake up before you? Uh, yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, there's unfortunately the, there's the flip side of that, right. isn't there? Because that's the thing that we often. It was the reality of growing up in the West and you'd even see the tropes in the movies and the dramas, the kids bundling into the parents' bedroom, wake up, wake up, and right. the parents want an extra bit in bed. Over here, it's the opposite. 
it seems yeah. to be, you know, from from the Korean perspective that I see that the parents are up and they're, they're trying to get the kids out of bed, not the other way around. This right. was a new thing for me. Yeah. And when kids are sleeping, they, they sleep, you know. Well, my daughter will wake up at the drop of a hat. Like yeah. if, if even if you just look at her, she'll she'll sense it somehow and yeah. up she gets. My son, oh, he's so hard to, to get out of it. Um, this is sabasa. This is different from person to person. But there's this idea of co-sleeping yes. that works. Because here's another difference. It was like it, from from birth, where I'm from, and it all depends on your resources and where you live sure. and how you grow up. But there's this idea that you put the kid in a cot in the room by themselves mm -hmm. and maybe a little speaker mm -hmm. and you come in and check and the parents have their own room. But mm -hmm. when I first came to Korea and I would see in some houses when we you know, go around to people's houses and I would see how families live, they would get they would turn the room into just a bed. They would mm -hmm. put all the mattresses on the floor mm -hmm. and they would just all sleep together. And you right. would sometimes see three generations of people yeah. lined up sleeping. Right. And it, it, it looks lovely, like once or something. <laughs> <laughs> but but co-sleeping is a thing here, sleeping with across Absolutely. generations. Absolutely. And, and, you know, if you uh, there was this movie called Minari uh, a little while back. I don't know if you know that. Uh, I know one it, of the I thing, Yeah. It. One of the things that, I don't know if you noticed, one of the last scenes was everyone just kind of lying on the ground by themselves. Ooh. And there was uh, there was an article about co-sleeping as well, because I think Americans found that so fascinating that, like, mm. you know, these three generations would just lie on the floor and sleep together, mm. you know. And, and it's one of the things that while doing co-sleep research, so we started doing a little bit more research with infants and children. Mm -hmm. And what we found is that the co-sleeping rates just differ vastly from, from country to country. So, you know, in a place like USA or, or Canada, what you'll find is that the co-sleeping rates are probably less than 10%. And co-sleeping, by definition, means, you know, you're sleeping either in a separate bed, usually, or in a separate room. Usually, it, it means in a separate room. Mm. In Korea, you know, co-sleeping is usually in the same bed. You know, everyone just kind of mesh together. Mm -hmm. And I think the co-sleeping rate is about about a little bit more than like 60 to 70 percent which is, is just really really high and it's interesting because you have these parents who are co-sleeping until like really really late into mm. the childhood like you know I had uh, I knew someone who was still co-sleeping with her um, like middle school son which I thought was maybe even a little what creepy. kind of what kind of age is middle school like 13 yeah 14, okay getting like, into you know, puberty you get, and things. yeah you yeah. have a little bit of a beard maybe yeah. you got the the deep voice and yeah. they're still sleeping together in the same bed i was like you know maybe you want to stop you that. gotta let it go love. Yeah, 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 yeah 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 i know you love him and all but you know it's it's not really helping his emotional development at this mm. point mm. does it what, what about with younger children though so uh, is is there like health to because it seems that a lot of Korean mothers will co-sleep with children. Right. And I'm not sure if that's, you know, husbands are working late, so they sleep in another room or something. Right. And I think mother. that's pretty typical. That, that seems quite common here. Right? Yes. I've seen a bit of that. But is it is it nice to do that until sort of like six or seven or eight? Does it build up the, the jong, the bond, or is it, no, they shouldn't do that? Well, the thing is that the, the, well, if you do co-sleep, what we mm. found is that the parents' sleep suffers. And so mm. they they have more rates, higher rates of insomnia. They don't sleep as much. You know, you know, you, you've mentioned this. Your kids kick and talk during their sleep, and that mm. wakes the mother up. Or they might cry during the middle of the night, and the mm. kid might get used to the mom tending to them, and they might wake up in the middle of the night and want to play. And this definitely makes the parents' sleep suffer. Mm. And that makes them less likely to tend to their children more uh, sensitively during the day, which mm. I think is, you know... Why don't you just build chung during the day and and, and sleep separately at night? Day you know? jung. Yeah, yeah. Day just have jung. the have the day jung. Don't don't you get you can get rid of the night jung. Basically, what you're doing with the night jung is you're just messing up the day jung. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Naj jung or something right. like that. Not right. not Naj sul, not not day drinking, but yeah. day jung. I like this idea. So, so you're. You're quite adamant that co-sleeping is... Yeah. Will it phase out? Because we're seeing career change and nowadays people have sofas in there, you know, and they have beds more. And right. I, I, in 20 years, I've seen it change from going to people's places and you're sat on the floor to all of a sudden you're on sofas. And the same with restaurants, actually. Sure. You find fewer and fewer restaurants where you have to go in and sit on the floor. But that used to be far more common. Right, right. Uh, and so are we going to see, do you think that co-sleeping will be a, a remnant of the past soon or does it have some cultural pull among, among the omonis? 
And I think that's a fascinating question because when I first started doing this line of research, you know, there's so much good science behind, you know, uh, advocating for, for not sleeping with your child after mm -hmm. six to eight months. You know, it shows that it's better for the parents' sleep. And basically, the child has the ability to self-soothe and fall back asleep by themselves mm. uh, starting from six to eight months. They have the physical ability to sleep alone at night and, and fall asleep themselves. But a lot of parents don't know that. And so they think that just being there and being on call for their child is the best thing emotionally for them. But, it, but it's not true, you know. And so, uh, you know, I think when I first brought up this notion with a lot of uh, friends, they were like, oh, you know that. I know you think that's a great idea, but it's a very Western thought. And you're not trying to change people's behavior. You're trying to change a culture, which mm. is really, really hard. And mm. I thought that was a very interesting point, you know, like, you know, well, how do we change a culture? You know, how does that work? And so we've been slowly trying to put the, the data out there, you know, showing that it does affect your uh, your sleep, you know, if you have a if you're a parent, and it does increase rates of uh, postpartum depression. It does uh, it does affect your marital satisfaction. You know, if you're sleeping in the room with your with your uh, child at night, you know what happens to all that goes on with your spouse. You know, if your mm. spouse is in the next room, you know it saves. It really um, doesn't leave a lot of room for intimacy anymore. You mm -hmm. know, so mm -hmm. and then that that does. You do see a lot of parents show that that do report that. You know, like after after giving birth, they haven't been intimate. You know, for mm. years and years, and I think that is definitely an issue. It, it if you even if you have a child from a psychologist point of view it, it should be there should be a very strong dyad you know there needs to be a strong bond between the relationship and it shouldn't just be all rotating around the child you know mm -hmm. and i think that sometimes the sleep arrangement kind of it's kind of starts there you know i think the the work that you do on on mothers and things like that is interesting because it seems to be helping them and perhaps we'll come to your book but what does it do to the kids so you said from you know six to eight months, then co-sleeping should end. But if children are doing co-sleeping, or they're being co-slept with until seven, eight, or something like that, or the, or the middle school of 13, God forbid, does it do anything to the children? Does it make them more dependent? Does it affect them in any way? Or Well, I, I do have to preface this by saying this is a very controversial topic, and I may get okay. some haters about like not advocate, advocating co-sleep. And I do want to say that I don't think all co-sleeping is bad. So there's mm. two types of co-sleeping. One mm. is when you're doing it kind of uh, proactively, where you're doing it because you want to feel a little bit more of a physical bond with your child, mm. and that's fine. You know, mm. like maybe if you're in the sa different beds in the same room and your your sleep is not suffering, that's fine. But a lot of people don't do that. A lot of people do reactive co-sleep. Sleeping, which means that, you know, they they are sleeping next to their child because they don't feel like getting up in the middle of the night when their child is is crying. Mm. And so they kind of leave them at arm's length and or they might start off in separate beds. But when the bed when the child starts crying, you just pull them into the bed next to them because mm. they don't want to bother with like going to a different room. Mm. And that kind of uh, co-sleeping, I think, can be problematic because everyone kind of learns to sleep in, in certain conditions. So, you know, you learn to sleep in, in your bed and you learn to sleep that, you learn that, you know, you have this certain blanket that you need to, to sleep. And, you know, everyone has learns yeah. these conditions. And, and it's the same with children too. And if the children learn that when they wake up, their mom has to intervene for them to fall back asleep, mm. then, then the child will never learn to fall asleep by himself. And that's why, you know, you have these kids who are like three, four years old and they never slept through the night because the parent has to intervene every time the child mm. wakes up and it kind of becomes more of a habit. And I would imagine that also has the potential to, like the night jong and day jong, go into the next day as well, that the children's always looking for the parents to intervene just as they do in night times as well, perhaps. I mean, does it does it foster or create that sense of dependency on the parents if they're always there? That's a, that's a good question. I don't think that's ever been researched, to okay. uh, kind of that, that kind of dependent uh, behavior. But I do think um, it is really prominent at night where, you know, the child definitely does have to learn to fall asleep by themselves mm. because it's the first step to learning self-regulation. If you think about it, you know, a lot of development is is learning how to self-regulate yourself, mm. your emotions, you know, um, you I'm know, like, trying. yeah, I like the temptations <laughs> of the world yeah. and, and learning to sleep by yourself is one of those things. And I think, um, you know, if you don't give your child that opportunity, it, it, they're never really going to learn to do that. Abs yeah, absolutely. Does it matter if 
Well, you've spoken about what's it called? Behavioral sleep interventions? Yes. BSIs? Yes. What are behavioral sleep interventions? So, it sounds very academic. Yes, it is very academic. So behavioral sleep interventions is usually another very fancy word for sleep training, which a lot of people do hate. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. And the reason behind it is uh, basically it's trying to get your child to sleep by themselves without any type of parental intervention. Mm -hmm. And the only way to do that is to let your child cry a little bit. Mm -hmm. So they have to, you know, if you're holding your child one day, and then the next day you don't hold them, they're going to cry a lot, you know? Yeah and, yeah. and when that happens, you have to kind of give them the opportunity to learn how to self-soothe. And usually if you start doing that for a week or two, they kind of learn that, oh, okay, mm -hmm. even if I cry, my parents not coming, they learn not to expect it. And they find ways, you know, they, they kind of like what, like, you know, they suck their thumb and they, mm -hmm. they uh, kind of rub their skin and they find ways to self-soothe themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and it helps them kind of regulate their, their uh, arousal level so that they could sleep better that sounds very important if, especially if you're doing that based out of a, a survival mechanism or out of necessity or something that you're learning to self-regulate self-soothe from an early age and yeah and you you find the problem here in Korea is getting these behavioral sleep interventions across to mothers because it, it's so hard to hear your children cry and not do anything. Absolutely. Like, and how do you do that? That it's... is the biggest barrier to, I think, implementing these these behavioral sleep interventions or doing sleep training. I think uh, for a lot of people, they kind of think about that. They, they hear the crying and they just hear their child in distress. And, you know, mm. I've done it. And mm. I know it's, it's a really, really terrible experience. You know, no mother wants to hear their child cry. Mm. And, you know, but... There's there's different ways to do it as well. Like you know, you can just have them cry it out and just you know, but you hit the kid in the the crib and then you're like Asta, you know, I'm mm. not gonna see you until tomorrow morning. Like there's there's a really kind of cried out method like that. But there are also more graduated ways where you know you might like check in a couple after a couple minutes or you mm. might like do it more gradually. Mm -hmm. So there are different methods to doing that as well. Are there ways to get kids to sleep? Because it's one of the. I mean, this is kind of like asking a a nurse or a nanny or something like this, how to get kids to sleep. Because uh, one of our children, Elizabeth, she, she'll drop off pretty quickly, no problem. Uh, and my wife is similar. I I, I struggle. Mm. I, I struggle to get to sleep and my son is the same. He'll just sit there, lie there, just like, what's going on? Like, what do you do now? Like, do mm -hmm. you count sheep? I counted to 1,000 and yeah, I'm still sure counting. Don't count sheep. <laughs> yeah, well, what, 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 do you have any advice on this for children or like sure. for well, me? <laughs> well, I think a big part, uh, one of the advices that I like to get, uh, the advice I'd like to get is to not think of your sleep as more of a, a light switch. It's not like an on and off switch where mm. you could just go to bed and turn it on. And especially some people are really excitable. You know, you have these kids uh, my, my younger one, Maxwell, you know, he's he gets excited super name. easily. And, and you know, he just needs a lot of time to wind down. So one of the really important things about sleep is you need to kind of get in the right headspace for it. Mm. And in order to do that, you need to have, like, deliberately have some type of wind down time before bed where you're doing some type of activity that is non-striving. You don't really have a goal, mm. something that helps you relax and wind down so that mm. you get into that right, right mind space to sleep. If you're already too excited, Excited, you know, you're you're not going to be able to, to sleep sleep at all. So that's Sh one of the good tips that I like to give people. Showers before bed for kids. Um, I think it just having a kind of more regular routine is important, mm. just to kind of make sure that kids know that sleep is coming. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you're taking a if you take a bath every night and then you read them a story, you get them in their PJs, brush your teeth. You know, this is kind of like a, a routine that they have, and mm. when they're doing this, they know that okay, it's time for bed soon, and they they kind of expect it. Whereas if every night is different, you know, I think it's it's a little harder. Mm. You're you're gonna laugh and scoff at this next question, um, and we haven't discussed it yet. Uh, in our various cacaos and things. Korean sleep and dreams, there's this thing called temong. Oh, yeah. Yeah, temong. I'd never heard of it before I came to Korea. Yeah. And I know probably the scientist in you is is balking at the idea. But I, I sometimes ask some of the, the young adults at the university. So temong is perhaps in English something like a prenatal dream that members of the family will have they'll dream that another member of the family has conceived or something mm, like that. Yes. So or, or even the person. Or even the person. But say, for example, the auntie might dream of a, a snake, an emerald, a peach, mm -hmm. these kind of things. And then they'll phone their sister and go, hey, are you OK? I just had a dream. And this dream signals your, uh, your conceiving or your conception. 
and I've asked young adults about this like recently, and and they're like, yeah, Temong's real, man. Like, yeah, yeah. It, 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 does, I know this is nothing to do with your research, but like, as as somebody that does sleep, like Temong's. Well, you know, I, I do think that there's a very big cultural piece to that. You know, yeah. I don't think it's ever been formally studied. I do know that, you know, for women who have their own temong, mm. you know, it's it's true that the hormones can change the way you sleep. You you can have very very vivid dreams. And you know, as kind of a, you know, a kind of a materialization of of what you you think you're going to expect, maybe that is one of the things you dream about. Mm. You know, so I think it I don't think they're like I don't think they're fake. You know, I do think it's a thing. And I think it's kind of like one of those things that Koreans like to talk about just to bond, you know, like, oh, what what blood type are you and mm. what MBTI are you? What yeah. was your temong when you were yeah. conceived? You know, like, I think it's one of the common topics that people like to talk about as well. And, you know, like kind of kind of put meaning into that, you know, like, oh, my temong, your temong was this. That's why you became like a great person. It's mm. because of me, you know, mm. want to take credit for that. <laughs> yeah. Build the daytime jog between right, people. Right, right. Exactly. Uh, and they're always good temongs. Mm -hmm. uh, just the same, like when you ask her, what's your name? And they'll say, Jihei, it means beautiful wisdom. <laughs> you're like, what's your name? David. I, because my mum liked David Essex or the singer or something like <laughs> right. this. It's, there is this beautiful meaning to things. Um, you, your book, Ali, mm -hmm. right. the English, how do we translate that? Uh, I did I, translate I it the other day. I actually did like your translation. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, a book to calm the sleep worries of mums. I actually really like that. A book to calm the sleep worries I of mums. I should translate it into English. Thank you. I, <laughs> I looked at it quickly and I thought that seems about right. Um, so you've written a book, and but it's there is this gender aspect to it. There's, there's this helping women here with mm -hmm. sleep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, the there is there are gender differences to sleep. Uh, so when when children are born, there mm. really isn't a lot of there isn't a really big difference in terms of how they sleep. Mm. And then that actually starts emerging around 11 years of age, which is kind of coincides with the onset of a menstruation in mm -hmm. girls. Mm -hmm. And then starting from there, women have a, a much higher rate, about 1.5 times more like higher likelihood of having sleep problems than boys. And, and it, 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 it kind of continues throughout their lifetime. And it's not just uh, biological, you know, there's it's an interplay between social factors, mm. you know, there's, there's more stress that's put on the woman mm. and things like that. So, you know, especially in a culture like Korea where a lot of the, you know, the parenting duties are put upon, are kind of placed upon the woman, you know, I did want to kind of write a book a little bit about kind of addressing this. You know, it's not just about letting your child sleep better. A big part of helping your child sleep better is also that you need to value sleep mm. as well. Because, you know, you see these moms and they're, they're just, you know, like beating themselves up for everything that their child is is you know has, has has a problem with and and that really shouldn't be the case you know yeah. so it's a little bit of a mental health book a little bit of a parenting book a little bit of a sleep book i was meant to bring it and get you to sign it ah. for me I, all of these things um you said that from the age of 11 uh, they're more like women young girls from the onset of menstruation they're more likely to develop 1.5 sleep problems yeah. what are what kind of sleep problems uh so the main uh outcomes that have been looked at are insomnia so usually like insomnia is characterized by not being able to fall asleep mm. or uh you know they might fall asleep fine but then they wake up in the middle of the night and they can't fall back asleep mm. or they wake up too early and they, and they can't sleep at all for the rest of the night so mm -hmm. th those are three symptoms that we usually call insomnia and that affects their daytime symptoms and the, the, women do have a higher likelihood of having insomnia. Mm. And that's been, you know, tied with a lot of mental health issues, a lot of other physical health issues, et cetera. So and, and you think this is a, a mixture of two things, the the physical menstruation, but also the, the social pressures the, yes. uh, that mm -hmm. plays a role in that? Right. And uh, so there's also, you know, the, the stress of just being a woman. It's also kind of biological in terms of uh, things, but also how people react to stress. You know, like women are more likely to kind of think about things. It's called rumination in psychology. So mm -hmm. thinking about things that happen and kind of going, replaying it over and over in their head, whereas men are more likely to kind of, you know, 
throw down a beer and go play some hoops, things like that. So just the way that they kind of deal with stress may be a little bit different. Yes. Uh, also, kind of the, the type of stress placed on them may be a little bit more burdensome compared to males, you know. So I think there's a lot of different things. And I think a, a big part of that does come from, you know, just, you know, giving birth, parenting, you know, all, all these things do do kind of contribute to the parenting to stress I, and not to say that you know like men aren't stressed out as well mm. men are stressed out equally i think but there is different types of stress i think sure. mm-hmm. no no and i it's interesting to learn the word of rumination and i can see um examples of that all over the place mm-hmm. and i'll <laughs> uh last night uh, a taxi driver uh charged my wife this amount and then an extra 3,000. And she was like, why did he do that? And it was because it was after 10 and there's this new policy or something. Mm. And so I said to her, listen, either you need to phone the taxi company or you need to forget about it. Mm -hmm. Because she was just ruminating and ruminating and ruminating. Is it, is it stressful to be, can you explain how it's stressful to be a woman? You just said to me, Ali, it's stressful to be a woman. Can you explain how it is, why it is? Rumination is one part. Sure. So... You know, like the, I'm sure you've dealt, you've talked a lot about this in your podcast, but you know, like the discrimination piece, I think, is there. Mm. Also, you know, kind of, I think in Korean culture, the expectation that you should be more docile and not speak your mind and things like that. And mm. I think sometimes that goes to the extent where it goes against your against what you really feel you know so you kind of have to really just you know there is it, it's kind of seen as a virtue where women don't speak up they don't speak their mind just stay quiet mm. and do what they're told you know and i think that that in and of itself self can be a little bit more stressful you know mm. yeah no it must be uh, very difficult how was your book received like did you get much feedback from it did what went on because to publish a book in Korea and to have it at you know the major bookstores and things like that, and you're you're trying to reach out. It seems woman to woman, and correct me if I'm wrong because I'm reading it in a second language. Sure. And, but you're you're trying to reach out woman to woman here. It seems did it did it work? Did well, unfortunately, it didn't sell that much. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I was talking to my publisher the other day about you know ways why that might be and Mm. and one of the reasons was that you know mothers are too busy to read books so that was one of the reasons we came up with you know they're trying to get their kid to sleep but they're not really going to rely on a book they might just go on like insta try to come up with like Mm. quick solutions Mm. so you know i really do have this kind of kind of strong opinion that women should know about this stuff before Mm. before they become a parent you know i think it's really important to educate the public about you know like it's not just having giving birth is not just completely like a bundle of joy you know mm. it's it's i'm sure you've you've uh, experienced it and there's a lot of stress that goes with it not giving and, birth personally yeah, but yeah. exactly <laughs> but parenting a child yeah, is stressful yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. kind of uh having inviting someone to to be another part of your family is is, is a stressful piece and mm. i think people really underestimate how stressful it is mm. so there's this there were these two stress researchers called Holmes and rahi and they did the this really interesting study where they kind of compiled all the things that could be stressful for humans and they kind of gave it like a a number of how stressful it could be. So number one, I think, was like a death of a loved one or something like that. And number two was like divorce. And uh, giving birth, I think, was like number 12 on the list. And it was actually higher than bankruptcy and higher than than losing a close friend, which I thought was really interesting. It was was really high Mm -hmm. up there. So I think people really underestimate how stressful it is and we don't really talk about it. So I think, you know, just stress, sleep, like not sleeping as a parent is is a huge part of stress as Mm. as a first time parent or a second time parent. And I think, you know, it was something, it was kind of me trying to kind of start a dialogue about it, I think. Mm. Mm. What, What were some of the main takeaways, would you argue, from the book? Well, there, there's a lot of uh, interesting pieces. I think the first was that the way that the book is kind of um, structured is that mm. I talk about the mother's sleep first, and then mm. I talk about how to make your sleep, how, how to get your child to sleep better. And I think with that, I was trying to just prioritize that, you know, with the mother mm. not taking care of herself, mm. you know, she, she's really not going to be an effective mother to take care of her child. It's not, they're not two separate things. So I wanted to kind of highlight that the two 
we're connected. Mm. And, you know, there's some tips on, you know, like how to make the mom sleep better. So, for example, a lot, one thing that a lot of mothers do is they, um, they put their kid to bed. They're mm. extremely sleep deprived, but then they stay up until like 2 a.m., like doing chimek and like watching the shows. And, mm. and, you know, they want that me time. And I think yeah. they feel guilty about having that time during the day, you know. So I think kind of trying to prioritize uh, self-care and prioritize sleep, I think, mm. uh, was really important or even some ways to kind of help themselves nap. You know, I think when their child sleeps, it's really hard for the parent to sleep because they have a lot of things that they have to do. But, you know, like telling them that napping is, is a good thing, you know, mm-hmm. I think we're important. There's a section in there about sex mm-hmm. where we talk about, you know, how it's important to kind of keep up the intimacy, you know, even after you've had a child. Mm-hmm. You know, you'll be surprised that the rate of sexless marriages is so high in Korea. If you talk to a sex therapist, a lot of them talk about how, you know, there's tons of parents who don't have sex anymore Mm -hmm. after their first child. And I think that's also a statistic that you'll see in the States. So I think I talk a little bit about how the sleep arrangements kind of make that important. Mm. Uh, So I think uh, these are just some of the things that we talk about. Also, you know, kind of not just seeing sleep as a very unidimensional, like, oh, my sleep is good or bad, but also Mm -hmm. all these different aspects of sleep. It's not just about like how much you sleep, but it's also about, you know, like is your sleep continuity? continuous you know does it affect the things that happen during the day Mm. um is your you know are you falling asleep during the day and and you know is it is it really bothering you like things like that there's a lot of things that you could do to um to think about sleep or so like sleep timing like are you falling asleep at a a good time so these are all things that you can think about in terms of sleep where it's not just like a good or bad sleep and then you're done Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. i think those are some things that you that i think might be interesting in the book yeah and and there's pic- lots of pictures in there as well, which I, I, I sure. find quite interesting. Can I ask you this respectfully, Ali? Was it too, because you said it didn't sell as well, but still mad props and congratulations for writing a book and getting Thank it finished you. and mm-hmm. having it in the book sh- uh, in the bookshops and things like that, because that's not an easy thing to do. And I, mm-hmm. Well done. I, I don't say that disrespect. Well done on that. That's uh, amazing. Respectfully, was it a bit too Western? <laughs> Like this idea of putting the mum first and getting them to sleep, sure. uh, to focus on their sleep rather than the kid first and the mum's meant to sacrifice because people in Korea will know this. But when mums in Korea speak to each other at the school or the playground, we've been taking our kids horse riding. The government gives them free horse riding yeah. lessons, right? The sungma, sungma dang, the horse riding thing. And the mothers refer to each other as Edward's mother and Donghyun's mother right. and Suji's mother, they're not women in and of themselves. They are, but they don't refer to themselves as that. Right. They refer to themselves as the mother of that child, don't they? Sure. Um, you know, I, I never really thought of it that way. I think uh, I think times are changing, you know, like yeah. no one is really, you know, wants to identify as someone's mother, you know, I think, and, and a part of, I think I do write that in the book, you know, like before you were a mother, you were, you were someone and, and, and you were That's someone, nice. yeah, you That's were nice. someone and you yeah. had this identity and, mm. you know, like parenting steals a lot of that identity, especially for women who maybe had to give up their careers or who put had to put their careers on hold or, mm. you know, their lifestyle has completely changed. And I think I hear that. I think I put that part in because I just hear that from a lot of mothers mm. as well. You know, they feel that they don't like they, they really miss their old life. Mm-hmm. And so I think, you know, just kind of that notion that they also do need to to put themselves first sometimes, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think we are seeing a little bit more of that. You're correct to, to talk about that change. Just when you were talking about quality of sleep and all of these things, as, as I get older, I, I don't think this is too much TMI, but as I get older, the, the nighttime we is becoming more of a, a regular occurrence. Like I dream of sometimes sleeping all the way through. And now everyone's wearing these. I, I don't have it on today. I don't like it as much. These Galaxy Apple watches sure, sure. and they measure your sleep and you'll wake yeah. up in the you'll wake up in the morning and it said you slept from this time to this time and. Uh, are they good? Should we be wearing those? It feels a little bit intrusive, I must admit. That's a great question because I actually do a lot of research with wearables. So they're they're called wearables, and they they've kind of become this the new gadget, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they have all these like really neat sensors in them and everything. Um, 
just from a sleep standpoint, there there are metrics in there that you can trust and mm -hmm. metrics that are kind of a little bit more rubbish. I would say trust right. kind of how much you sleep. Right. I think that's pretty accurate. And also like when you went to sleep and when you woke up, I would say those are pretty accurate. I would trust, How does it do that? Sorry. Uh, so it's with it's movement. So usually it's making the assumption that if you're if you're asleep, you're, you're still. So if <laughs> yeah. you're a bad sleeper and you're like, if you, if you put it on your child, it's going to say your child doesn't sleep at all because yeah. he's moving around, right? Mm. But, you know, it just assumes that if you're sleeping, you're still. And so it measures kind of how how long you're not moving during mm. the night. And it has, you know, every company has their own algorithm. Before we go to the next part of it, that you can't trust the data, good sleeping is still sleeping? Um... Based based on the Act Watch, yes, and yeah. I think uh, they have also they also use other different types of sensors. So, for example, Apple Watch has a very good, I think, um, heart sensor. Mm -hmm. So it, it also takes into account like how fast your heart is beating and things mm -hmm. like that. And then you know some engineer puts all these together in a in a neat algorithm and and kind of uh, spits out whether you're sleeping or not. So you reckon we can trust how much we're sleeping or when we're sleeping? What are some of the things that we can't trust on, on these wearables? I would be a little bit wary about trusting kind of sleep stages, like how deep you're sleeping or how mm. light you're sleeping. I think mm. most of the watches do tell you, like whether you're, you've been sleeping deep or like the percentage of time you slept deep or lightly. Mm. And, and the reason for that is uh, it actually affects how you feel during the day. So there's been a study. There's been a study that gives people sham feedback. So it gives you like fake feedback okay. on how you slept uh. based on the wearable. And they found that if you gave you good feedback, you're fine. But if you gave you bad feedback, most people felt a lot more tired during the day. Wow. And it was completely unrelated to how they actually slept at night. So, you know, you don't want a piece of a wearable to tell you how to feel during the day, right? Right. right. So you want, you know, to, so trust it kind of like half, but also trust how you, how you feel. I think that's also really important. That's so fascinating. The placebo effect and things right. like this. So you use the word sham, but it's like, you know when everybody was getting into MBTIs and MBTIs oh, and yeah, I hate things MBTI. like yeah. Sorry. Oh, if you if you Google my name, if you neighbor my name, yeah, you're, you're going to see a bunch of articles that have completely um, completely put MBTI down. I do not like. Oh, go on and put. Let, let me tell you one, and then please put MBTIs down for me because they've become such a huge thing over here. But previously it was blood types. People would come up to me yeah. and go, "David, what's your blood type?" And I would say red because i didn't know it wasn't a thing sure do, do you know even, your blood type now gosh i've forgotten because it's just not interesting to <laughs> right, me and right. um, but people would always go david you look like a bee which was insinuating i was a bad boy or yeah, something it means your ter personality is terrible <laughs> yeah yeah thank you very much for saying that and, and then they say you also look tired david thank you for saying that as well but then the MBTIs became a thing and Hanyang University wanted me to do it so they could advertise my courses with my MBTI. And I was like, no, nah, you're not doing that. What I wanted to say about the, sh the sham placebo effect is I didn't like it because there might be some young people that are slightly introverted or something or not creative as much. And they'll do the MBTI and it will tell them you're an introvert and you're not creative. And they will then live out that... Um, what is it? Depiction of themselves. Right. And it, and it would be so interesting to give people the opposite MBTI of what they are and they could become completely human, new human beings. Like, so if you tell people you slept well and then they feel good. Mm -hmm. But if you give these kind of quiet kids this MBTI that says you're outgoing and creative, I wonder if it might make them outgoing. Can we do like, can we get some kids and do a test? <laughs> is that ethical? <laughs> no, no, it's not. No, it's not. I'm not being serious. But what's your what's your problem with MBTIs then? Well, uh, I'll name the, you the, later. <laughs> sure, sure. You can you can look at all my articles later. Yeah. But there's you know the, the notion that you could divide the personalities into sixteen categories and and mm. the whole population somehow fits neatly into those categories. I think is problematic. Also, personalities are are you know by definition stable. But if you do the MBTI over years, it changes, you know? Mm, so, like, yeah. you know, I used to be this. I, I even forgot what I was because I hate it so much, right. right? But then, like, you know, you can also kind of change your answer. So there's also, like, good MBTIs and bad MBTIs, kind of like blood types. So they say that O mm. is good and mm. B is bad, right? So MBTIs, there are these, like, really good creative MBTIs, and they're the ones where, like, you're a serial killer, right? Yep. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, you know, you don't want to be those. And so you can kind of, like, change your answers to fit what you yes. want to be. Yes. And I think that that doesn't say anything about you at all. It just says what you want 
want to be, you know? Mm -hmm. And also, the really important thing about any type of personality test is that it should predict your behavior. And it doesn't tell you anything about your behavior mm -hmm. or, or anything, you know? It's, it's just a category. It's like a, you know, it's just... And, and also, you know, there's the thing about the Barnum effect where you could read someone mm -hmm. an explanation and they'll say, oh, yeah, it's totally me. You're like magic, you know? But it's, it's some random reading, right? Mm -hmm. So I think there's, there's a, a bunch of different things about it. And here's an interesting thing is that the, if, you, if you look at academic journals, mm. you won't find anything with MBTI. It's not like a valid right. psychology personality test or anything. Mm. I think people want to think about it that way. I think the utility in, and I'm not saying that it's completely useless. I do think it's a great conversation st starter. Yeah. I think it's a great thing to use with marketing. You know, the other day I, w I saw a uh, Mandu MBTI. So like the <laughs> MBTI was like Mandu and it was like Mandu MBTI. And so it was telling you based on your MBTI, what kind of Mandu you should like eat. Like kimchi Mandu, Galbi Mandu. Yeah, galbi like mandu. if you're a, yeah. like ENTJ, you should have like this kind of Mandu. I was like, oh, okay, that's a pretty cool that's marketing fun. strategy. That's fun. They should do it with booze. Yeah, they or do booze. It with alcohol, right. Yeah, I think yeah. that's a, MBTI marketing is pretty real, and I think that it's a great way to kind of you know kind of catch attention, mm. capture attention, and I think that's fine. But you know, to if you're really trying to diagnose serious problems or really trying to figure out your your personality for you know for your future for whatever reason, maybe that's not the personality test you want to choose. Mm. I completely agree. Mm -hmm. Somebody told me that. Um, Shout out to Unbi. She said, Professor, if you ask Western people about their MBTI, they'll tell you the labels like activist, prof uh, mm. philosopher, blah, blah. I can't remember anymore. But these kind of the artist, you know, campaigner. Mm -hmm. And if you ask a Korean person, they'll tell you INFT. Right. They'll tell you the exact alphabet. But they've, they believe that if you ask mm -hmm. Western people in, in her mind, that they're more likely to tell you the label. Mm. My problem with and one thing that I had with MBTIs was I believe just like these watches, these wearables, um, there's a book called Surveillance Capitalism that I thought was fantastic mm. by a, uh, a professor at Harvard and her name was Shana Zubinov, I believe. Anyway, the book is called Surveillance Capitalism. And it was all about getting our behavioral data, how much we sleep. And mm. one of the reasons I got scared of that watch is because I would get out my car. And I would go somewhere and it would send me a message going, do you want us to take a picture of where your car is so you remember where it is? And I'm like, no, I know where I park my car. You don't need right, to do that. Right. But I realized how much it just knew about what I was doing. Sure. And it was trying to help. You know, it's right. very nice of you. Thanks very much. But I don't need to know where that is. And so when I asked another book this is related to is the book Mindfuck, which was looking at the Cambridge Analytica um, election of President Trump and Brexit and how they manipulate this data through right. algorithms. Um, what they want is they don't want your national identity number or your name or your date of birth. That information is useless to them. Right. They need your personality. Right. They need these things. And so MBTI. Right. I think MBTI was just data mining the whole Korean population. And so sure. they've got all these personality models now. Because I asked students, did you do it? And they were like, yeah. Did you pay for it? And they were like, no. Mm -hmm. Why would this company give up this huge product sure. for you for free? And all the students like, oh, my God, they got me. I did it five times. And they'll have this working sort of data model of all of these people, how to just t to get them. Yeah, that's scary. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it, it, it can be. Speaking of the digital world scrolling past bedtime yes. I'm pretty good I'm lucky that I grew up without social media without phones I vividly remember my parents coming into the room in the morning and I'd be in trouble because I'd stayed up all night like reading by torchlight under the covers reading mm. books I was reading books at mm. least um, getting in trouble for not sleeping for staying awake reading but scrolling past bedtime, it must be so difficult to be mm. a young kid and to have all that whatever you want on TikTok and Insta just sure. coming at you. And it's and it can be live and they can be girls or boys or dancing and cars and everything. It must be so hard for people's sleep. Right. And those algorithms are really smart. You know, yeah. I think there's a, actually a saying in Korea where, like, I was trying to sleep, but the, the YouTube algorithm kind of, like, guided me elsewhere. Like, I think there is actually a, a real saying about that. And and I think it's, it's kind of a – it's kind of like a – 
a perfect storm. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the the companies that are trying to prevent you from sleep. Um, the the other thing is that it's also the lifestyle of Korean people or people all over the world where there's just so busy during the day. There's this fierce comp competition, mm -hmm. and then the nighttime is the only time they kind of have for themselves. And I don't know if you've heard the term revenge bedtime procrastination. <laughs> no. no, okay. It sounds like some indie band. <laughs> no, we no. are revenge. <laughs> right. So, so, so this concept of kind of like staying up and postponing your bedtime past what you are originally desired is called bedtime procrastination, and it usually happens when you don't have any external circumstances for doing so. Huh. So it's like, you know, oh, I wanted to sleep at 12 today, but oh my God, I saw this fascinating thing on Netflix and I just had to get to the end and now mm. it's 4 a.m., you know, crap, you know. Mm. That's kind of what bedtime procrastination is. And you kind of know that you're going to suffer the next day. You're like, oh man, I'm going to feel so tired the next day, but I just can't put it down. It's that kind of feeling. And the, the revenge bedtime procrastination mm. piece of it is that you feel that you work so hard during the day that whatever time you had left, you just have to, you just want to like kind of re-exert that control over your day mm -hmm. with whatever time you have left and usually that's scrolling for a lot of people mm -hmm. like li lying in your bed you know there's there's even a lot of pictures about it where you're lying sideways on your bed your phone is phone is plugged in because you don't want to run out of juice mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and you just you know keep on going for hours and hours and we uh, when we did research with this on university students I was kind of shocked because the amount of time they would spend on their phone doing this was like three or four hours a day I mean if you think about it, that's about 30 hours a week you know people work during that time <laughs> and it's a, it's a pretty long t uh, period of time so you have this this new kind of phenomenon of called bedtime procrastination mm. I like that revenge bedtime procrastination mm. like taking back autonomy or taking back control from the man sticking it to the exactly. man by, by scrolling TikToks except and stuff the or... ultimately the only person that really suffers is yourself yeah, I mean yeah. it, is it really revenge if you're suffering I get that part of it a student, Taeyeon, she said that, yeah, but they only, they use their smartphone three hours a day. And I was like, well, that's quite a lot. And she, she was like, no, David, that's not a lot. Mm -hmm. Like, that's not a lot at all. Like yeah, 10 yes. hours. Is, it, it, the, young people are using their phones a lot. This is how I know, Ali, that I'm getting old. My phone will last like two days, oh, wow, two and a half days without charging the battery. That's impressive. Because I, I, I try not to use it too much. It's a fight. I'm controlling my temptations, but um, I try not to use it too much. What have you learned about social media or these phones and and sleep? Because I would imagine in my uneducated mind that teenagers don't have the greatest self-control. Yeah, there was actually this really interesting uh, newspaper article, and I love the title. It said, I would rather give up my kidney than give up my phone, which is <laughs> was a quote from, like a direct quote from a teenager. And, you know, it's, we live in an era where, you know, the kids can't live without their phone. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think I could live without my phone either. Mm -hmm. So so it is, it is real. And what we found is that, you know, a lot of people do spend a lot of time scrolling before bedtime. It's one of the studies that came out of our lab is that people who do procrastinate their bedtime spend about 70 minutes a day uh, on their phones three hours before bed. And if you think about that in like a week mm -hmm. standpoint, it's, mm -hmm. it's, that's a lot of time, you know. And, uh, you know, the reasons why people do this, you know, it could be the revenge uh, for it could be having like feeling like they deserve it. Mm. Or but there, there are some other reasons we found was that people feel lonely, you know, like they don't, mm. you know, people with COVID and everything, they don't feel they have the social connection, but also with people being on their phones all the time, especially in a hyper connected society like South Korea. Mm. You know, we see these people uh, like going to eat together and they're both on their phones or even like families, you know. So I think people, even they're they're physically together. They they feel lonely, and so they use the phone as, as a way to try mm. to connect with other people before they go to bed, and it kind of helps them kind of feel a little more calmer. That's nice. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think another reason, uh, the biggest reason we found was that people use it to kind of uh, get rid of their negative emotions. So they might be feeling depressed or, mm. you know, that rumination piece where they're mm -hmm. kind of thinking about their day and they have all these negative thoughts and worries. And when you're on your phone, you know, you see this, you know, hamster eating a carrot, it, you see like pandas farting you know like all oh, this is great you know it helps you kind of in the moment forget about mm. all your worries and I think that a lot of people are using it for that you, you've sold me on the idea that it's good 
Well, <laughs> not necessarily. So that, that 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 there's a function to it is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, like no, people yeah, aren't just right. doing it just for the heck of it. Yeah. It's it's serving a purpose for some people. It's helping mm. them, you know, feel better. It's helping them feel more connected. It's helping them reexert control over the day. But but the thing is that they're sacrificing their sleep for it. And so, you know, people are sleeping less because they're postponing their bedtime and and one of the things that at least do is things like uh, insomnia. Mm. It's associated with depression, more anxiety. So I don't think we could really see it as a positive behavior. I think mm. we should really see it more as a, as a health interfering behavior. You know, sleep is important. And if this is getting in the way of sleep, it's kind of like how smoking get, it gets in the way of your pulmonary health or, mm -hmm. you know, how alcohol gets in the way of your liver health. You know, I think bedtime procrastination is also something that gets in the way of your sleep health. Yeah. Is it just because it gets in the way of your sleep health? Is there anything to do with the bright lights or anything like that? or like the blue screens and digital sure. screens because uh, there's this there's this dude called Andrew Huberman I think his name is Oh yeah he's uh, famous he's Yeah he's he, he he's the idea that you know when you wake up don't look at your phone and go out and see the sun and get the um circadian mm -hmm. <laughs> did I get it right this time the circadian rhythms going and mm -hmm. I try not to look at my phone when I wake up. I try to reach for a book and go to the curtains and I go and stand outside and, mm -hmm. and these kind of things. Is there something about um, digital devices in bedrooms with sleeping? So there's a lot of controversy behind that. I don't. I think the, the studies are really inconclu inconclusive, mm -hmm. saying that you know the blue light is really harmful. And I think there's been a bunch of experience that have just shown mixed results. So I, I, I don't really want to comment either way. I do want to say that getting sunlight in the morning is helpful. Mm -hmm. It really does help kind of set your circadian rhythm and helps you know get you going, kind of strengthen that alertness signal in the morning. It, it is really helpful. Standing next to the window is usually not very helpful because the light gets filled. You want to get um, you want to get about like ten thousand lux in the morning, which is like on a really bright day. You want to be out in the sun. Lux. Yeah, yeah. What's lux? A lux is a kind of a it's a measurement, it's a of, measurement of light. Yeah, it's a oh, measurement light. of a brightness of light. Mm -hmm. Wow, it's a good word. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm thinking L -U -X. lux interior. So yeah, I'm lucky. I get to stand outside. So it is that. But so it's not so much the devices in the bedroom. That, that's quite interesting to me. Uh, I, the results are mixed. I'm yeah, sure there yeah, there yeah, might yeah. be something there. There is some research that shows that if you're more of a, a night person, if mm. you're a night owl, you might be more sensitive to this kind of light. So maybe maybe it doesn't affect everyone the same way. Maybe it's just like a proportion of people mm. where it affects people. You were at Stanford as well, weren't you? Alan? I was, yeah. Did you meet Huberman? Was I did he... not meet Huberman. I met people who worked with him. Okay, <laughs> yeah. okay. Uh, any he's, he's a little too famous for, for oh, me to just uh, casually meet him. <laughs> I don't know how famous he is. He's a big lad, I think. Think, yeah, seen yeah. It, you, you wouldn't want to. Um, ASMR, mm -hmm. four letters. Um, I can't. It's weird to me. Like people watch. Shall we try some ASMR? Because people might listen to this. Watch. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I like the, I like the crunchy sounds. Like I like it when people really? eat the tweaking. Okay. Yeah. Why do? You, People sleep to ASMR, right? right? And, and that's, a, that's a whole thing. But does this help? Is it just like a white noise? It's like falling asleep with the television on, yes. just like people did. Or I've heard people would put fans, fans or hoovers on. on. Yeah. Um, but now a lot of people will fall asleep to ASMR stuff and they'll sure. have something on. Sure. I, I, there is no research that shows that ASMR actually helps. Okay. Um, I think some people are really sensitive to noise. I think you said your daughter was one of them, right? Yeah. Mm. So some people are more sensitive to noise, and usually that that white noise kind of may drown that out a little bit. And I think people can learn. I say, say sleep is kind of like a learned behavior. So mm. people can learn to sleep with that as a background noise, and then you know as time goes by, they they kind of have to have that condition mm. to sleep. Mm. So I think for some people it's helpful because it kind of helps them drown out any type of background noise because they're sensitive to it, you know. But it, it, I don't think there's any indication that it, it vastly improves sleep. Are are women 
more prone to ASMR? Do women? It seems to me, and this is completely uneducated, base speculation, but I get the impression that women like ASMR more than men. Am I wonder I, why. I've never heard that before. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't like ASMR. Yeah. You like the crunchy twiggy sounds, you said? Yeah, I just like to watch it. You know, it's, I guess that's more mukbang. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is mukbang. But <laughs> I've learned that's why people like mukbang yeah. sometimes. They like that sound and they right. like the they like the whispering and all of that. But I stuff wouldn't. I would on. never listen to it while I sleep. I guess. No. Can Can we learn languages while we sleep? Uh, that's a really good question. I think people. There was this notion that you were trying to make your sleep a productive time as well and I think that's okay. a very Korean thing way to think you know like yeah. I can't waste any time like yeah. you know no. got to learn my math formula as well I sleep and I think there was a little bit of uh, data that showed that you could learn like some automatic like maybe involuntary things while you sleep mm. but I don't think there was a lot of really good results I mean if, if there were people would be like learning languages while they sleep I think if, if you're if you're kind of like if you're trying to learn something, it's, mm -hmm. I think that kind of is very different from what sleep really is. Sleep is restorative. It's supposed to, you know, kind of let you, you know, plug, like, you know, become completely unplugged and, mm -hmm. and restore yourself, recharge your batteries. And mm -hmm. if you're trying to do something during that time, I think it's really counterintuitive. But that's just my two cents. I like your two cents. Are there any, before we go on to the, I, I want to ask you about the actual study of sleep because it must sure. be weird to look at people. Are there any other things about sleep we talked about asmr and lights in the bedroom are there any other things about sleep that might be quite interesting or misconceptions that people have about sleep where it's like no actually the science and the data doesn't back that up oh, are there that's any a really good question so there i think people get really caught up in the fact that you have to sleep a certain amount of hours and, and that's actually not true like you know i think it's recommended that you should sleep seven to eight hours and the reason why they say that is everyone needs a different amount of sleep mm. and if you line them all up you know it kind of averages around seven to eight hours and that's mm. why are they get their numbers from but everyone one is different you know there are mm. some people who can sleep five hours and sleep fine. I mean for example how, how long do you sleep on average four five hours okay yeah. yeah and if you're and maybe that's just how much you need if you're not feeling really super tired during the day maybe you maybe you do but no, if you're, if I you're feel like, pretty strong yeah if yeah. you feel if you're falling asleep during meetings maybe you need more if you're falling asleep during bus rides maybe you need more but if you're if you're functioning fine maybe you mm. need a lot less maybe you need a lot more you know I had a patient who was sleeping 10 hours a day and she couldn't function at all if she slept less than that so you know don't get too caught up in the hours it's actually a lot more important to actually uh, think about quality as opposed to quantity. You can mm. sleep 10 hours but get half terrible sleep. Mm. Or you can like take a power nap for 30 minutes and feel awesome, mm. you know, after that. So I think it's a lot less about like the hours than as it is about the quality. I think that's a common misconception. I definitely want to come to power naps uh, at some point in this because sometimes I'll close, I'll sleep for like five minutes and then boom, that's all I need. Mm. Just five minutes and mm. I put my feet up. Um, what determines the amount of sleep that people need? Because I, I would like to suggest that when I was 14, I grew up reasonably affluent, comfortable middle class, didn't need to work. But I had a paper round when I was 14. Mm. Had to get up early for that. And my parents always made me have a job. It was mm. just, you know, you have to learn the value of money and hard work. Mm. And my next job, I had to work. I worked down the docks and uh, the shift started at 630 University was a bit of a, a bit of a different story, but my first job in Korea, we started at six forty-five a.m., mm. and then when I worked in a Uniguan, that started at seven fifteen a.m. Mm. Uh, I w I have radio every morning, like from seven a.m. So I I think it's just behavior. It it's just learned. I don't think I'm maybe genetically programmed to do it, but I've always had these jobs where you got to get up early. Mm. And now I have to drink less because I can't roll through the next day. When I could when I was 20 and 30, sure. no problem as I get older. But yeah. what determines how much sleep people need? So a part of it is genetics. You know, I think okay. it's determined by genetics. I think a part of it is age. So when you're younger, you obviously need a lot more time to sleep, to recuperate. Um, I would have thought that would be the opposite. When you're, you're younger? Young, when you're young, you need more sleep. Well, when I, I'm talking about ch childhood. Oh, okay. Like childhood, mm. I think, uh, you know, like when you're newborns and stuff, yeah. you, need, you need a lot more sleep. I think <laughs> that kind of uh, levels <laughs> off when you're an adolescent and you're, mm. you become a young adult. Actually, when you, and then when you become older, you even, you need even less sleep. Mm. 
And so, you know, sleep changes as you age. So I think there is, it is a little bit of a function of age. And it's also a function of kind of your lifestyle. You know, I think, you know, if you have kids, you're just busy and you can't get as much sleep as you used to. You can't sleep in until 12. So I think it's kind of um, a kind of a, a mixture of all, of all of that. And, you know, sometimes people do have, you know, strong preferences or strong biology. So for example, for someone with your schedule, if you were a night owl, I don't think they could have they could have done that. You know, like mm. if someone who was going to bed really late and waking up really late, I think if they had to keep a, a schedule where they had to be at work at seven, I think that would be really terrible. So mm. at the sleep clinic we do see a lot of people like that where, you know, by profession they have to get up early, like medical students or, mm -hmm. you know, anesthesiologists who have to, you know, be up really early uh, to get in before the surgery. Or, you know, I'm trying to think of jobs where you have to get up really early, like radio hosts. You know, yeah. you get a lot of these people and, 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 they, and if their biology is really strong and prone towards nighttime, I think it's really hard for you to, to mm. sleep, mm -hmm, to sleep and get up at, at those hours. Why do we, I want to definitely, I want to ask all these things I want to ask you about, <laughs> like um, your sleep, sleep clinic, sleep clinic, yes. Uh, why do we need less sleep when we age? Uh, so, so it's a little bit, uh, I don't know if I'm the best person to, to answer this, but it's kind of like if you're running, if you're, if you're, your running ability, if you kind of, uh, kind of use your running ability as a comparison, when you're young, mm. your ability to run fast is, is great. Right. Mm. But then when you, when you're older, it, it kind of diminishes. Mm. And, and similarly, like your ability to sleep kind of dim diminishes with age and it's a host of different things. So like, mm. it's kind of like eye, your eyes aging. And mm. so your light does the light doesn't get through as as well as you, as it did when you were younger and so the sleep regulation kind of um, can become disrupted the it's light a, doesn't get through when you're awake when you're yeah your eyes so your eyes yeah. age yeah and then so the light I'm not sorry I can, the I'm luxes trying. don't come in no well <laughs> your, your, your eyes age and yeah, so yeah, like the light yeah. permeability yeah, is not yeah. as great as it used to be and also things like, you know, one of the, th the hormones that really helps your sleep is melatonin. It's called melatonin. And um, that doesn't get secreted as much as it used to be mm. as when you were younger. So it could be like biological changes like that. Or also changes like, you know, when you age, you get a lot of these physical illnesses. You, you might be in pain. You might have joint pain. Mm. You might, for men, you might have like prostate problems that make you wake up uh, frequently during the night to, to go to the bathroom. All these things can actually cause you to, to sleep less or sleep less well than you used to when you were younger. Mm. What about the sleep clinic? So you, so this is about, I want to ask you about studying sleep because it must, it must be weird to like sure. look at people sleeping because it's the most, it's, it's part of like romantic love songs. Like mm. I, I count your eyelashes while you're sleeping and all of this kind of la di da di. But sure. it, it must be a bit like being a serial killer or something, isn't it? Just watching people sleep and right. They blinked and they turned twice. Is that what you do? So uh, I think you're, so sleep can be studied in, in many ways. Yeah. And the, the sleep clinic part I think you're talking about is, is something called a, a polysomnogram where you go into the sleep clinic and they hook you up to all these different wires. You know, they measure things like your brain signals. Um, they measure your, your breathing, your muscle tone, leg movement, snoring. Mu muscle tones. Yeah, yeah. So like, you're, like how. If you're like, tense. Like, yeah. Well, like if you're moving about like okay. some people they kind of move a lot when they're sleeping so they want to measure that as well mm -hmm. and also uh, when you're in deeper stages of sleep you kind of lose the muscle tone so mm -hmm. it's also a way to measure how deep you're sleeping and so there's this thing called, there's a, a way to measure a sleep called a polysomnogram and it's it's kind of the most invasive way to, to measure it you go into the sleep clinic you sleep there overnight that they, you they hook you up someone's watching you there's a video camera to show like everything mm -hmm. that you do while you're sleeping and then someone analyzes it and that's invasive but that's not the only way that you could actually measure sleep so there's wearables like we talked mm -hmm. about before people use them a lot and um, they're not like completely accurate but they will tell you to some degree how long you slept or when you slept mm -hmm. and these are both of these marker these instruments Instruments are called objective markers or sleep. So, in, in one in really interesting mm -hmm. th sleep thing about sleep is that your objective markers of sleep are not necessarily the same as your subjective markers of sleep. So, let's say, like, I might ask you, mm -hmm. you know, how long do you sleep at night? You know, you might say eight hours, but 
you know, if you wear a watch, that might say five hours, and right. the, the two reports might be completely different. So uh -huh. we always want to get some type of subjective marker of sleep. So these are things like, you know, asking you how your sleep quality was during the day. You might have slept a little, but your sleep quality might be fantastic. Mm. Or, you know, you might do some questionnaires. Usually one of the things we do is we have them keep a sleep diary. You know, like when you're dieting, you have to write down everything you eat. Mm -hmm. It's kind of similar. You keep yeah. a sleep diary and you write down like, oh, you know, what time I went to bed, how long it took me to fall asleep sleep, mm. how many times I woke up during the night, like all these all these things. So we want to kind of get a little bit of both. And there's really one interesting thing about sleep that maybe I think you might find fascinating is, and I think you actually asked me about it, is something called sleep misperception. Have you have you heard about that? I asked you about it, of course. No, I'm not <laughs> sure what's, what's sleep misperception. So sleep misperception is when uh, the objective markers are telling you that you're sleeping, yeah. but you think you haven't slept at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. like, mm -hmm. and, and people people around you say, oh, you were like snoring and you were like mm -hmm. sleeping really well, but then like you feel like you haven't been sleeping. So the objective markers are telling you one thing, mm -hmm. but then you subjectively feel that you haven't slept at all. And mm -hmm. it's kind of... This, this mismatch between objective and subjective sleep. And, and it's actually quite common around, uh, um, among people who have insomnia. And the people that come into the clinic, people with, ins like, you knock on the door and you say, like, I'm sleeping too much, I'm sleeping too little. What kind of people go to sleep clinics? Uh, so a, a lot of different people. So there's a, a bunch of different types of sleep disorders. The mm. most common ones are insomnia mm -hmm. and something called obstructive sleep disorder. I don't know. Obstructive sleep no, sorry, that's not right. Obstructive sleep apnea. And it's usually when it's more of a physiological reason where you're not breathing while you're sleeping uh, and you need a little bit of a special device called a CPAP to help you uh, breathe uh, because your airways become obstructed, which is why it's called obstructive sleep apnea or OSA. And usually, you know, people come in because they kind of have this kind of vague complaint that they feel their sleep is not restful or they're not getting enough sleep. And then they come in to do the sleep study mm. and it kind of determines whether it's really more of a physical problem or more of a, a little bit of a more of a, a psychological problem. Mm. And so usually a lot of the times insomnia can be more based on like things like stress or, you know, more psychological issues. Mm. And those people get sent to me. Whereas if you have more of like a, a medical problem, mm -hmm. then, you know, you go see the sleep doctors and they might either perform surgery on you or, you know, uh, prescribe you some type of mask to help you sleep better or, or get on some meds or anything like that. So it's, 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 a, it's kind of like a mix of different types of people. A, a couple of people I know, they're, they're rather on the larger side. They always spoke to me about sleep apnea mm. and needing this thing. And I sort of always equated it to their their overweightness and their big bellies and things like that. I'm not sure if that's correct or incorrect. but uh, So there is a kind of a body morphology that is associated with sleep apnea. Um, I think for, especially for Western people. Can I just ask what sleep apnea actually is? Is it like snoring too much or you can't breathe so or airways? So basically you're not, your airways are obstructed and you're no. not breathing like you normally would be. Okay. Yeah. Right, right, right. And, and it doesn't happen like the whole night, but mm. it does happen in episodes. And it mm. happens, if it happens frequently enough, mm. then the you count the episodes, and if it happens a lot, mm. then you you they tell you that you have obstructive sleep apnea. Okay, okay. And um, you said something about the about West. That. Yeah. So the West. So in the West, body morphology is more OSA is more associated with more of a kind of obese, and I, that is the true I think with Korea. But I think I heard that more often with mm. Asian countries, you'll mm. find people don't have that body morphology, but they also still have OSA, mm. like sleep apnea. So it, it's not just necessarily just about the, the, the way that your body looks. So let's imagine it. I've got insomnia. Mm -hmm. I, do, I, I don't. I, I'm sleeping all right. I enjoy my sleep. Well, when I sleep, but Imagine I've got insomnia and it's decided that it's psychological and then I come to you, Dr. So, mm -hmm. and, and you're going to help me. And so it's, it's, it's about psychological counseling rather than the physical aspect of it. What do you do with people? Do you sit sure. them on a couch or like? Well, I do have a pretty nice hat couch. But, uh, <laughs> there's a there's a non pharmacological treatment called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, and it's actually the first line of treatment for insomnia. Usually, when people can't sleep, they think yeah. they have to take the sleep meds. Mm. But actually, uh, people a, a lot of the associations now find that there's enough evidence to recommend it as more of a 
the first uh, treatment that you should go to before taking meds. And it's basically looking at your sleep patterns, your sleep habits, mm -hmm. kind of your thoughts that you have about sleep, and then kind of um, modifying those things so that you can sleep better. So you mm -hmm. might have... Uh, you might have bad sleep habits that are that are maintaining the sleep problems. For example, like you might take too long naps, or you might, you know, try to go to sleep too early, and you're just tossing and turning in bed mm -hmm. in hopes of catching sleep. I mean, uh, all those are pretty characteristic of insomnia patients. Or you might take, be drinking way too much, trying to make yourself fall asleep, or exercising mm -hmm. like a ton to to make you fall asleep. All these things are are really bad habits that interfere with sleep. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people don't know that, and mm -hmm. those are things that they are trying to compensate. For. They're they're using their comp compensatory uh, mm -hmm. behaviors, trying to sleep. And, and it's usually, you know, not helpful. So we kind of look at that, the, at that kind of as like a, a whole. We look at their sleep problem. And every week we make small changes that, that will help them sleep. So it's a little bit different from sleep, from just regular psychological counseling where you're mm. just like talking about your feelings and maybe crying. I mean, people still do that too in mm. counseling. But it's a little bit more focused. It's a little bit shorter of an intervention. If you have any people that need help sleeping, I'd be happy to mm. give them a sleep consult. But there are definitely a lot of... Um, there's definitely a lot of cool strategies that people don't know about that they can definitely implement in their daily lives. Can you give us one for free? Like, <laughs> Absolutely. I know you're a counselor. Sure, like, sure. No, no, no. So I, I'm not a counselor. I'm a clinical psychologist. There's a sorry. difference. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Sure, sure. Uh, so uh, one of the things that is really important is to make sure that you're not lying in bed for a really long period of time awake because mm. your brain, you know, your brain wants to know that your bed bread is your bread. Your bed <laughs> is used only for sleeping. Yeah. And so if you're, you know, lying in bed, tossing and churning, your brain starts to think, oh, you know, I thought the bed was for sleeping, but now mm -hmm. I guess, you know, this is a place where you worry, you know, and so you start getting, you know, once you go to bed, your brain starts becoming wide awake and kind of you condition it to start worrying. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things mm -hmm. is only using your bed for just sleep and, um, and and sex and nothing else so mm -hmm. that's one of the tips another i think really useful tip is kind of differentiating between feeling tired and feeling sleepy have you ever i don't know if you've ever made that distinction yeah exactly like in korean yeah, don't yeah, they? Yeah. yeah yeah i think we just say tired but well, go on please yeah Ali. so so feeling sleepy is kind of like the propensity to to have your like eyelids feel really heavy mm. and if you're in like a really boring meeting or you're watching a really boring show you kind mm. of like have, feel your head get heavy mm. and if you go lie down you can probably fall asleep pretty fast whereas feeling tired is like you don't have any energy in your mm. body but your mind is kind of tired but wired <laughs> and so if you go uh, lie down usually you can't fall asleep right away because you just have all these like like stuff in your head that you need to sort out mm. and so there, there's this distinction between the two and you should only go to bed when you're sleepy but not when you're tired but a lot of people use like to go to bed when they're tired and, and scroll on their phones or just mm. like lie there because mm. you know they just don't have any juice left in them when when it, it doesn't happen to me but I, I used to when I was doing my PhD and I my, my schedule was absolutely brutal um, there would be some nighttime classes that I was attending that was mm -hmm. it was a bit difficult for me and I used to um, pinch my leg mm. as a way of staying awake like I, I don't know it's a bit I don't mean it was sadomasochistic but you you describe that feeling of when you're in a a class or a lecture and your head starts to go mm -hmm. and you know you're fighting that thing right um i would sometimes like pinch my leg or i'd sometimes even find a safety pin or a mm -hmm. pin and i would i would prick yeah, myself to, yeah. just to make sure bang you're awake mm -hmm. um didn't do the toothpaste under the eyes <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah I, I, i've got enough dark circles i could put them in there it would, it would get away with it are there any tips to staying awake when you have to stay awake you're asleep uh, sure you might no. say don't do it sleep but no, staying awake is important. I mean, coffee is the best way. Yeah. yeah I think coffee, uh, exercise, I think, is, is a, another way to kind of help you uh, stay awake. But I, I think the strongest thing that people usually talk about is, is coffee. <laughs> yeah. Caffeine. I was just wondering when you're in that situation because Koreans drink a lot of coffee these days. Yeah, Ooh. and it's not great. That's not great. It's gonna it's gonna interfere with your with your sleep if you sleep if you drink it too close to your bedtime. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm pretty regular in that. I'll have one 
about two, three hours after waking up, and then I'll have one after lunch, and that's mm. it. So this is this is a rare thing, but yeah. I've got in this habit. Like I can treat myself. I'm all right. I can sure. manage it. Um, and it's it, it's only a royal milk tea. Yeah. Um, Koreans people didn't really drink coffee twenty years ago. Yeah. When I first arrived, it was green tea. Yeah. And and nothing else. But now they've got into these jumbo compost it's mega so coffee, weird. just cheap ice americanos. Let's go. Right. Like. All over the place. It's all this so coffee. It's so weird. I remember, like you know, I used to tell people I like to drink black coffee, and they'd be like, "Oh, you're so bougie," you know. <laughs> <laughs> and now no one says that to me anymore. No, 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 no. And the coffee culture here isn't like espresso, sipping espresso right, no. in a cafe. No, it's like I want a double shot americano. Right, give let's... me my venti. Yeah, 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 yeah. My 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 sister in law, she'll she'll be hesitant to drink it like a Coca Cola after five o'clock or six mm. o'clock. She's in her forties, but she'd be like, "That's great." I won't be able to sleep tonight. You mm. know, that's 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 how it gets. Um, you when you spoke about this sleep clinic thing, and you talk about people coming in doing the intrusive one. Mm. Was that was that what it was called? Yeah, when you the, monitor them the, in the yeah, poly, uh, the polysomnogram. Polysomnogram, um, or PSG for short. PSG. That's thank you very much. PSG. That sounds like a terrible, terrible way to monitor people's sleep because it's really hard to sleep in a new place. Yeah, absolutely. Like you're in your place and you can sleep if you have routine. And I think what you say, a lot of it is psychological, right? Rather than physical. It's once you've got your routine, you're healthy. You don't have the Koreans. They call this ibul kick. Right. When you're lying in bed right. and you remember that stupid thing that you said 15 years ago right, or that, right, and you're like, right. oh my god, why did I do that? But it must be a really weird way to to get people to come in and sleep in a foreign environment and Absolutely. use that as a monitor for their sleep. That doesn't seem right. Well, we're not really trying. Uh, well, the reason why we do the PSGs is we're not trying to really see how they sleep normally. We're trying to see if they have a sleep mm. disorder. Mm. So you know, you're trying to figure out if they have something serious, like like if they're not breathing during their sleep, mm. and we need to monitor their breathing and their brain in order to figure this out. Or you know, there's a disorder called. Uh, Sorry, periodic limb movement disorder, where you just keep uh, kicking your legs while you're sleeping, and you know you would never be able to know that unless you're monitoring it through the night. So you don't have to sleep if you're sleeping seven hours. You don't have to come and sleep seven hours, but you just need to sleep a little bit so yeah. that we know that there is something going on or there's a diagnosable sleep problem. I asked you about Temong. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you about Kawi? Oh yeah, that's a great topic. I love talking about. I love talking about it. <laughs> okay, so for those, go on then. Sure. Because people might not know what kawi is. So, either. so in English, it's called sleep paralysis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, kawi also means scissor. Is yeah, it? The I don't same? know why. Yeah, I don't know why it's called kawi. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have no. I don't have no idea where that translation came from. But basically, it's when you like regain consciousness, or you have consciousness, but you see these really scary things that are around you. Usually they're like ghosts or evil forces, right? Mm, yeah, that's what you're kishin, talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Kishin, yeah. There's normally a lady when, yeah. when people talk about it's it. It's like mm. shadows, something like sitting on your chest. Mm. And, and it's really scary for a lot of people and they can't move mm. their body so they can't like jump out of it. And there's actually quite a scientific explanation for it. So usually it happens a lot more, uh, a lot more, it's a lot more likely if you're sleep deprived. Mm -hmm. And so if you're sleep deprived, what happens is uh, you kind of go directly into a stage of sleep called REM sleep, mm -hmm. or you might come directly out of a sleep stage called REM sleep. And what happens during REM sleep is that your muscle tone becomes, you, you, you basically become paralyzed. Your, mm -hmm. your, your muscles become like constricted because they, you don't want to act out your dreams while you're sleeping because REM sleep is a stage where you're predominantly dreaming. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you're, you can't move. But then what happens is you're, you're, you regain consciousness first, but you're still kind of dreaming. You're in that dreamlike state. So you see things. Mm -hmm. You don't have consciousness. You can't move your body. And, and, and that's what sleep paralysis is very scary. Mm -hmm. But it's not like, you know, your evil spirits are trying to take your soul or anything like that. I think a lot of people like to put religious explanations onto it, you know? Uh, I never thought about it as being religious, but I've heard lots of people in Korea mm. talk about it. Mm. Lots of young sure. women, maybe it's just the stress. Because they don't sleep that much. Yeah, it, 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 that, <laughs> yeah that's why. Just, and I, when people have that, you know, I tell them, you know, if you're in that state, move your, move, move your toes or try to move somewhere in your body. For some reason, that, mm. that seems to work, just mm. trying to move part of your body kind of gets rid of it and then also get more sleep, you know? Yeah. Yes, doctor. <laughs> As a clinical psychologist, yes. did I get it right this time? Sure. Um, 
Do you ever do dreams? Is that part of it? Like you have to do sleep, you monitor people's sleep, you get them into routines and do dreams come into it or is that a bit too Freudian? Just because you mentioned REM. Sure, sure. Um, we, I don't like, I don't analyze dreams per yeah. se, uh, kind of like the more traditional Freudians do. But one thing I'm really interested in is nightmares. Mm. So we, because we work a lot with people who have trauma, mm. uh, one characteristic of people who have a lot of trauma are they, they have a lot of nightmares. And so there are ways to kind of uh, get rid of those nightmares during the day, which, which I find fascinating. And we, we kind of do work with that. Mm. Mm. That's quite interesting that you would get rid of the night stuff during the day. Yeah. That, that would have to come into yeah. it there. There's a really interesting study that came out of Harvard by a, a researcher called uh, Robert Stickgold. And what he did was he used Tetris to kind of illustrate this point where if you do something, keep on doing something during the day, mm. then it will show up during the night. And so he took these three groups of people. Uh, one group was very like experienced with Tetris. Mm. One group was playing Tetris for the like almost the first time. And one group had... Um, amnesia so they, mm -hmm. they couldn't remember even if they played and what he did was he had them play for several hours a day and he had them practice and then he had them go to sleep at night and then when he woke them up in the middle of the night you know he mm. asked them well how were you dreaming about playing tetris and he found out that you know the more that you did it during the day you know it did show up as a dream mm. and so that kind of illustrated the point that if you can if you practice something during the day mm. you know a lot of the times nightmares is a little bit like a habit so you can kind of mm. change that uh, by practicing another script, you know, during the day. So what we do is, um, you know, it's something called imagery rehearsal therapy, where mm -hmm. a lot of the people who have trauma have the same nightmares over and over. They kind of have the same nightmares and it doesn't really change. And so we take that nightmare and we have them re-script it. We have them write it out and then change the nightmare mm -hmm. into something a little bit more positive or something that is, uh, you know, a little bit more neutral for them. And then we have them rehearse it over and over during the day and it really interestingly their, their, their nightmares start to change just a little bit it's, it's wow. really interesting and a lot of the time sometimes the nightmare goes away completely and we don't do, we do that without even really uh, dealing with the trauma part so we're really just helping them sleep better mm. so I think that's that was a really powerful study that that we did and I, I really enjoyed uh, working with the trauma patients so it's not lucid dreaming, but it's priming them. It's sort of visualizing yes, these things. Yes. It's, it's faking it until you make it and getting yourself yeah. in the well, right headspace. Well, it's kind of like thinking about sleep, about the nightmares more as a habit. A lot of people who have trauma mm. think that yeah. they're having the nightmares because of the trauma. But actually, like a lot of the times, they just become two separate entities. You're, you're having the nightmares because you're just having the nightmares. You mm. know? And so we're just trying to change that, that broken tape. We're, we're giving it another another script you know mm. we're not letting the, the broken tape replay over and over again as a um clinical psychologist and somebody that studies sleep and you have all this information and all of this guidance i imagine that you sleep perfectly oh i knew this you were going <laughs> to ask me that question it's like but isn't it the fact that psychologists also have to visit psychologists or Abs yeah is that how that works what does it work with you and your sleep is it well you know I, i'm not going to say that my sleep was always the best you know mm. i did go to i did go to do the entrance exams in Korea and everything. I was one of those really, really sleep deprived people. Mm. And, you know, you have these people who I, th I think it kind of depends on how well you can cope with sleep deprivation. And there are people like me mm. who do really, really terribly if you don't get that amount of sleep. And I think mm. I was just one of those people who was really, really sensitive to sleep deprivation. And I just was so miserable during high school because mm. I was always so sleepy, you know, and I would like try to sleep during classes. I would fall asleep everywhere. And then, you know, I, I went and started studying clinical psychology and I started getting into sleep. And I just realized that there were just so many things I was doing wrong with my own sleep as well, mm. you know, because, you know, I was, I, you know, I, I used to pull all nighters all the time and it was just, really terrible or I would you know when you're younger you're you're fine making the choices where you know you would yeah. rather hang out with your friends all night than then actually go to sleep which mm -hmm. is better for you so you know with those changes I just found myself uh having these really drastic changes I think the biggest change I found was the mood changes mm. so like you know I feel that you know before I would be really irritable if I didn't sleep but then like once I started getting more regular sleep I mm -hmm. would feel a lot more stable during the day and I think a, a lot of people 
that would resonate with a lot of people. Mm. So, you know, I do think that now I'm a really good sleeper. I think before I probably was not. It's a really long answer to your question. No, no, no. It's because it's not being irritable for me. If I if I feel tired, I'm more likely to go and uh, buy a burger or, or something like mm. this. You know, I, I generally eat pretty healthy and do my exercises sure. as I age. I, I, I try to look after myself, but... If I'm really tired, it'll be like, right, I want a Coca-Cola. I want something greasy. Let's get on this. Sure. And I'm so quick to make those decisions. And it's when I'm tired that, th that those will come. And so I guess it's a, it's those those life decisions. You make better life decisions when, you, when you're well rested. Sure. You're also, you know, I think it also ties in with this uh, notion of self-control or self-regulation. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So you're you're it, it, you, in psychology, you kind of think of it more as a muscle, right? Mm -hmm. And and you know if you don't really, if you it's it's that ability really becomes attenuated if you don't sleep very well, and you know you tend to make decisions that you normally wouldn't make. Mm. And I think that that is the case with the the late night snacking or the fast food. Mm. Absolutely, absolutely. A couple of questions from some people here, Ali, sure, if yeah. I can, and we'll see if there's anything else we're missing. Um, Janio, uh, who goes by the name Spicy. Yes, um, I love that name. Yeah, she, she is very spicy as well. Um, it, it, that's how she would describe herself. Uh, fascinating character. She wants to know about power napping, mm. how to power nap without sleeping five hours. And, and, and is it effective? Now, I, I mentioned very briefly earlier that sometimes if I'm having a very, if I've had a very busy couple of days or if I'm, I can shut my eyes and it will only be about five minutes mm. and that five minutes, just five minutes. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, bang, I'm good. Sure. And it's such a short time that it, it seems like the time is so short, but the difference that it makes to how awake I am sure. is incredible. Right. So how do power naps work? Do they work? And how do you not just sleep? You know, there was this book that I read about napping, and, and I really like this quote from it. Uh, mm. It was by Sarah Mednick, and she said, you know, the world is divided into people who can nap and who can't nap. And I actually <laughs> completely agree with that. There are some people who cannot nap for the life of them. Yeah. Uh, if you are a napper, I think there definitely are a lot of benefits to it. So um, the thing about napping is, you know, it doesn't have to be for a long time. Mm. And actually, they recommend that you don't sleep for a long time because what happens is, you know, one of the really key things you need need to have a good night's sleep mm. is to build an appetite for it. We call it a sleep drive. Mm. And so it's kind mm. of like if you have an appetite for food, it just means you have to go hungry for a long time. And the more longer you go without food, the more hungrier you become. Mm. So it's the same uh, principle with sleep. Whereas if you stay awake for a long time, the longer you stay awake, the more sleepier you'll be at night. Mm. And right. uh, if you nap, it's kind of like taking a huge like eating a huge snack before dinner and you're not gonna, you're going to lose that appetite for dinner so mm. you really don't want to take a long nap especially close to bedtime so i think uh, what they really recommend is sleeping less than 40 minutes 30 to 40 minutes is probably like a good amount of time for a nap mm. um, if you go to sleep any longer what happens is you go into really deeper stages of sleep and it's actually harder to wake up you wake up and you feel really groggy mm. you feel like you know it feels like it's really hard to get going. You just want to go to sleep again. So there is, uh, there are definitely benefits to napping. Definitely should not sleep for five hours. Mm. And if you can nap, you know, definitely, I think if you feel refreshed when you wake up, I think we can just by definition call that a power nap. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it has this uh, association with sort of the executive power nap or something like mm. that. It, it's the way I've heard these power naps. Is that why it's called the power nap? Maybe. Think of that. Yeah. But I, I see students do it. I'll be like, right, we've got a 15 minute break. We have a three hour lecture. There's a right. 15 minute break. And sometimes some students will go, right, they get their head down on the desk and they're power napping. Right. And it, it fascinates me that they would do that. Sure. I actually think that's a big, uh, the big results of not getting enough sleep. Like I, I cannot, I, I would never be able to sleep in a room of like a bunch of people. Right. I think it'd be really hard. And I think I would, re I really see that in, in different cultures. I think yeah. it's definitely a Korean thing. Yeah. 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 You, you see it and you might even see it in offices or something like this. Sure. It's just this idea that leave me alone. I, I'm sure. putting my head down. Um, definitely kind of goes like that. Tam uh, Solpyeong, there's something else about napping that it's, uh, it's it's gone from my head. Tam Sol Pyong, who is uh, doing a PhD at the moment, she's a mm. colleague of mine, and she she asked when I put this up, 
why am I always tired when I wake up? Why is she always tired when sure. she wakes up? It's because she's doing a PhD, isn't yes, it? Yes, yes, yes. Bad <laughs> life choice. Yeah, you might want to rethink her cho- life choices. Yeah. Um, but uh, in, uh, but in a little bit more of a serious note, there is something called sleep inertia. Have you heard this term? I'm just throwing out all the sleep terms for you Keep tonight. Keep doing it. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. So sleep inertia is kind of like the idea that it takes some time. When you wake up, yeah. you know, no one automatically gets up and like wants to go for a jog. I think that's really really rare. I think all these TV shows are doing mm. the world a huge injustice when they show like people wake up and they're like, let's go. You know, like <laughs> most people wake up and they feel like shit. You know, yeah. and they need they need a minute to to kind of get going Mm. and this is called sleep inertia I also like to call it sleep drunkenness because that's Mm. kind of how you feel Mm. and usually it takes about 30 minutes to an hour for most people to kind of get going it doesn't necessarily mean that you didn't sleep well the night before it just means that your body needs a little bit of time to get going and also the fact that um, you know um, sometimes if you're an evening person it takes Mm. a lot longer for you to kind of get over that grogginess Mm. Mm-hmm. And so it just could be that you're maybe more of a, a night person mm-hmm. and you're just waking up a little bit too early that is not really aligned with your with your biological rhythm. Another thing is that um, there's this also no show, notion of non-restorative sleep. So if you're really stressed out, mm. sometimes you sleep and you might not feel that your sleep is really restful. And I think that that mm. is a really big complaint for a lot of people who mm. work. And so if you're stressed out, it's kind of like your body's a little bit on, on guard, you know, like you're kind of half awake and mm. you feel like you're, you're not really going into the deeper stages of sleep. So that might also be another explanation on why she doesn't feel tired in the, the PhD thing. You need to have a good mind to sleep, don't you? Absolutely. It, it, because you're unfortunately. I mean, the Buddhists talk about enlightenment is freeing yourself from ego and attachment and things mm. like this. You know, quieting the monkey mind, that sure. constant nattering. That's what sleep requires you to do, isn't it? You you need to get this little bit of enlightenment or the opposite, endarkenment or something. But it's very hard to shut your mind off, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. I think, you know, I have patients who come in and who say, oh, I wish I could just like, you know, like cut out my brain while I'm sleeping. You mm. know, like there, there's definitely a lot of inner litter in there that I think a lot of people have a hard time getting rid of. In a, in a litter? In a litter. It's just... It's just uh, okay, yeah, yeah, no, I just wanted to make <laughs> yeah, it was one of these sleep terms again. No, no, it's not. It's just a, it's just an alley term. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, I like yeah, it. it's in like a trash litter. in your head that yeah. just won't go away. Yeah. Grief case. Yeah. yeah I like the the idea we all carry a grief case yeah in a litter is that what sleep is then sleep so sleep is very physical and it's something that we require to keep going it would seem but sleep is learning how to be at peace with our mind well is that the wrong way i mean sleep is automatic and natural for most people it's not something that you necessarily have to learn Mm. but if you're not sleeping well you do have to relearn it it just means that you you you're kind of your body is kind of stop kind of thinking of it as a natural process usually Mm. you know one of the the most important conditions of sleeping well is that you need to you know you need to be a peace of mind you need to you need to not be stressed out and the Mm. thing is that you know you have a sleep system but you also have a wake system and this wake system is really easily activated by threat and mm-hmm. so if you if you feel threatened in any way, that could be like work stress or, you know, like any type of stress at all right. or interpersonal stress. If you feel stressed, your, your wake system is going to override your sleep system. Your brain doesn't know what kind of threat it is, but it's going to say, oh, maybe this is really important for me to stay awake for my survival. And mm-hmm. so I'm going to override the sleep system. So even if you haven't slept for a week, you could go, you could still like not be able to sleep because your brain is kind of uh, registering it as mm-hmm. being more of a being more of like a threat like let's say there's a war going on you know you mm-hmm. need to be able to be awake and run away and go s- and like you know evacuate so that you could stay alive and kind of that's how your brain um kind of brain uh, feels about every threat in your life and so you know kind of managing these threats which i'd like to call stress mm. is, is really important for sleep I like the idea that if there's a war, we need to stay awake and run away. It's, oh, it's no, we, we have to run at them. We have to, if there's a war, we have to go get the valley. <laughs> I, I like that quote from Zelensky. Oh. He, said, he said, I don't need a helicopter. I need a gun, <laughs> which, which I thought was quite good. I'm they a were wimp. Like, I, I don't think I can <laughs> fight anyone. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's all different in the real world, I think. But uh, yeah, this it, it feels... I'm understanding sleep 
a little bit differently now. The, the importance that it plays on people's mental health and life decisions and an intimacy and who we are even as people you know this idea that we need all of these things and mm -hmm. and sleep makes us better people when you talked about this kind of uh sleep drive and the awake drive and this fight or flight kind of um biological evolutionary genetic makeup that we have inside us that will sometimes override the need for sleep is there that we can change sleep in the future as we as we become transhumans and we go into this digital technological world and will sleep continue to evolve i'm trying to ask i know i'm looking into the future but the the world today is very different from you know when we were running around sure. in, in the trees we were watching out for the snakes and all that kind of stuff will sleep evolve will we that's such a great question and you know, I think I think we do need to differentiate between like like sleep, the behavior itself, and mm. like the the behaviors around sleep, like kind of the more voluntary. You're talking about thing. the sex again? Not the sex. No, no. <laughs> what's the behaviors around sleep? I Sorry. do like talking about sex, but yeah, yeah. I'm not talking about the sex right now. Yeah. So it's more like you know when you go to sleep or what you do before bed or uh, like like when yeah those ritualistic things, mm. more voluntary behaviors. I I think will for sure change. Like for example, no one looked at their phone like 20 years ago right but now they do so i think mm. and the the thing though the effect that those devices or things have mm. on our sleep will i think change i think the behavior itself is such a primitive thing that mm. has been here since you know the the beginning of time that i don't, I don't think that in and of itself will change even god chilled out on the seventh day didn't he sure, if, you, if sure, you're in the bible sure. like come on man if he, right. if god was korean he would have no he would have no, he, he would, he would have been like nope <laughs> yeah, yeah. no go let's keep on working <laughs> and then he would have had more mental health problems and or she and smited us with more plagues and <laughs> right <floods> right and <laughs> um are there any uh, what's what's the cutting edge of the sleep academic field or are there any unanswered questions or because you've talked about a lot of the data sure. and research that has been done yeah is there like when the sleep academics get together are these the, these questions that they're still ruminating over or, or brooding over. There's so much. There's so the sleep is such a big field. I, I know that people. That's hard to believe. Ah. Yeah, but sleep is such a huge field. There are people who you know study all these different types of disorders. There's engineers who make the devices, mm. and there's a bunch of things. And I bet every field has their own kind of challenges on things they want to do. I think uh, the kind of the hot topic that's been around for the past decade has been more about the aging population. There there was a really interesting article that showed that, you know, uh, not sleeping enough or not sleeping at all could actually be a, a cause of Alzheimer's disease. And with people mm -hmm. living longer and stuff, mm -hmm. I think, you know, is there a way to kind of use this as an intervention and, and things like that? I think that was a little bit of a hot a hot topic. And especially like, you know, with all the technology and being able to look at the brain and stuff, I mm. think that was... That has been really interesting. I know that probably is not interesting for most people, <laughs> but <laughs> no. But I guess if we're living longer and we're sleeping less because of the changing world, that cognitive functions as we get sure. older. I mean, everybody wants the, this idea of, you know, dying before while you can still wipe your own bottom or something like that sure. would be nice when you got some dignity, I Remember, guess. But. Yeah, and also I think uh, kind of a non in the non academic sense. So I, you know, I spent the last year in Silicon Valley, and there was this huge group of people called the Body Hackers. You, uh -huh. You've heard of them, right? Like there was a huge. They, they were trying to like track everything in their body so that okay. they could kind of make it the most optimal. You know, optimal the, part, optimal their own optimal self, and I thought that was really interesting, and, and I think sleep was a really big part of it. What did I've heard about this guy who was like, I've reduced my age by ten years. Exactly, or something the like body that. hackers. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. I drink activated almonds and kale every morning. Mm -hmm. Or what were they doing with their sleep to reduce their? What was oh, it? Sleeping uh, more, sleeping less, you know, sleeping in um those like flotation a, tanks. Obviously, I'm not a body <laughs> hacker, so I, I actually have no idea. I just know that these people existed and I know you know I talked to like I had a neighbor who was who was very much into this and we had like a lot of conversations about all the digital devices that mm. you could use to measure sleep so I think it mm. was a lot about just like 
having the data, having yeah. the data. Because if you have the data, then you can manipulate it. You know, you can find ways. You can do all these different things to manipulate it. And mm -hmm. I think that's interesting for a lot of people with all the technology that's emerging with the sensors and everything. You can you can measure everything. I mean, in our sleep lab, we measured how much light you got. You know, like things like that. That's interesting. And with the more information, I do think that there is uh, ways to kind of change things. Mm -hmm. Is there it, the data, but also sometimes it's the stories, it's the sham, it's the placebo. It's, right. I, I like that aspect of it. I like this psychological aspect of it. Um, is there anything we're missing? Is there anything we're missing on sleep, Ali? Yeah. Is there anything that I brushed over that you're like, David, mm -hmm. this is so important in the Try sleep field? Or is there, a, there's a couple of nice quotes you had in there. Right? Yeah, you, said, you know, you... when I when I do talks, so I, I, I love giving talks to the general public because, you know, no one really, no one really thinks about sleep that much. Yeah. I mean, they're just like, oh, sleep is important, but they don't really think about it. And so when I give these talks, I usually like to um, kind of have them rethink the value of sleep. You know, do you really value sleep? You know, you say it's important, but do you really value it above other things? And so, you know, I, just to kind of give you some quotes about how our society in and of itself doesn't really value sleep, I think. Let me mm. see if um, there's some, some really funny quotes that I, I like to quote, like Thomas Edison, mm. who uh, said, sleep is a criminal waste of time and a heritage from our cave days. I thought that was hilarious. So and then, um, criminal. well, the thing about him was that he thought you shouldn't sleep, but then he was sleeping all the time because he was sleep deprived. He would nap all the time. And so it was, that's interesting that he said that, or there was also, um, the quote from Napoleon when someone asked him how much a person, how much sleep a person should get, he answered six for a man, seven for a woman and eight for a fool, which I thought was also interesting because he was also a chronic insomniac patient who like constantly fell off his horse because he was dozing off. I mean, if he was, it was like driving behind the wheel. It was like dozing behind the wheel. So he was also not a very good um, example. But, you know, kind of this it, with people like this saying it, people who are high profile, I think it kind of sets mm. the tone for, mm. you know, if you want to succeed, if you want to become like a, a genius, a chanje, you know, mm. a youngje, you know, mm. you need to sacrifice sleep. And I think that's that's problematic, especially in a society like Korea. So I think, um, you know, it would it's good to get the message out there that there are that sleep is really important. And and really rethink how it can be uh, good for you, you know. So I like to kind of think about, I like to talk about that a lot. Have you come up with a pithy quote or phrase or expression? So like six for a man, seven for a woman, and eight for a fool. Oh. Is, like these things, they I heard yeah, it once catchy. and it rolls off the right, tongue. Right, right, it's so catchy. You, you know, I think you, we need one of these, Ali. I know, to, I haven't just, been able uh, to come up with a, a clever one myself. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I know yeah. there's a guy at University of Berkeley called, uh, University of California, Berkeley called uh, Matt Walker. Uh -huh. who wrote a really famous book called Why We Sleep. And mm. he had this TED Talk where he says uh, sleep is our superpower. Like, And he mm. kind of quotes how like, if there was a medicine that could give you all these like wonderful effects, like, would you take it? Mm. And all these effects that he stated were, were, were like the effects of sleep. And so I think, you know, kind of something along those lines of like sleep is my superpower, maybe a little bit more catchier than I'll work on it. Mm. Yeah, no, no, I look forward. I look forward to hearing that. Um, Shall we say good night to people? Ali? Yes, yes. <laughs> is that is that something that you guys do? Yeah, no, I, I don't know, but let, I, I think let's do it today. Sure. So, good night, everybody. Yeah, right. I was a bit more the, honorific. The, the yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> this was fascinating. Uh, no, no. Thank you so much for inviting me. As I said, I don't usually get to talk about sleep that casually. So this is, Quite, uh, it's right, it was casual. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Yes, we got it. We yeah. got it. I do want to ask Representative Gates how often you Political correctness. American dream. Man, you see how woke I was? I called you out. It's right that and so on and so on. We live in Kiwa. You see the peace. Don't do late. 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 Don't do